Hey, I started uploading daily to the second channel and things are going pretty great over there. If you want more content from me while you wait for these longer videos on the main channel, I highly recommend you go and check it out. Link in the description. Now, on with the monster that is this video. See you on the other side. There's this old story about Pixar that I hear a lot that I think is kind of relevant to this video. So I'm gonna try to retell it to you all really quick from only my memory. If I get anything wrong, I'm not sorry. The story goes like this. All the big wigs at Pixar, like the guys who really had all the power at that studio, came together for lunch one fateful day and started discussing the future of their animation studio. The legend says that at that one lunch, the Pixar big wigs came up with the ideas for multiple of their most popular movies of all time. I'm not being sarcastic here either. I'm pretty sure two of the movies they brought up at this lunch were Wally -E and Up. Like these were legendary movies, all being thought up on the exact same day at the exact same lunch. So how is this relevant to whatever the hell this video is? Well, I have my own story related to this very YouTube channel that's actually quite similar to the Pixar one. Let me take you back to the distant past of 2022. Shortly after I had released my iconic, most underrated FNAF fan game video, I sat down by myself and started to think about the future of my YouTube channel. What videos would I eventually put out to further my career and make people more interested in me and my content? On that fateful day, I came up with three different video ideas. Three ideas that would end up representing wildly different eras of my journey on YouTube and how I make the content that I make. The first of these videos was a sequel to that underrated FNAF fan game video I just mentioned. It would be a video on the Five Nights at Candy series, and why I thought the way I did about it. That video would eventually come out the same year, and ended up starting a whole new arc on this channel, where I pretty much exclusively reviewed FNAF fan games for a bit. Night Shift at Chungus's, also known as One Night at Chungus's, is an extremely small FNAF fan game made by me- Yeah, I think I may have been losing my mind back then, I'm not even gonna lie to you all. <laughs> There's only so much you can say about games that all share the same core gameplay structure, and I think I pushed that goddamn limit with that. The second of these three videos would be a video about the infamous animation YouTube channel known as Three Lame Studio, and the whole last rabbit hole that came along with him. This video was eventually made, but not until around a year after I had the idea. Finally, we have the third and last idea I came up with on that very day so long ago. An idea that was so out there for my channel at the time, that I genuinely thought I may never make it. A video idea that went from being something that might be like 20 minutes long, to something I fear could be like an hour long. I guess you all know how long this shit is now, but I'm here in the past writing this damn thing. I'm scared, bro. But yes, that final idea from my day of brainstorming is the very video you're watching right now. A video on a game that I played during my childhood didn't touch for years, but eventually ended up replaying and loving it years later. It's truly a magical feeling when something you liked as a kid still holds up as an adult all the same. However, what I didn't anticipate when starting this journey is just how much I would have to say about this game and the lore around it. This is a story about a fantastic game made by fantastic developers in one of the quickest gaming turnarounds I have ever seen. And even though this game is great, the truth is, it can never be re-released again. By all counts, the game I will be talking about today is banned until further notice. And it's all because of one person. One YouTuber. But who? Why? How? Can you just say the name of the damn game already? Well, strap in, folks, because this is my complete deep dive on the 2015 classic, PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist. Yes, I am not kidding. <laughs> now, after that epic intro I just presented to you all, the last thing you probably expected was this video to be on a fucking PewDiePie game. But trust me on this, you are gonna want to stick around. It may seem kind of crazy at first, and in some regards it absolutely is, but PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist is like, unironically one of my favorite video games of all time. That's 90% of the reason I decided it would be a video topic all those years ago during my brainstorming session. I knew that there was so much to go over that it would make for an interesting topic. So enough trying to convince you that this is a good video idea. Let's just get a move on here. In order to talk about this game, we need to go all the way back to 2014. Regardless of what you think of the guy now, this was arguably prime PewDiePie. Maybe not in the style of content he was making, but in his cultural reach, absolutely. I'm pretty sure this was around the same time that South Park did that episode where Ike was addicted to watching PewDiePie, so that should tell you how big of a phenomenon this guy was, even in the early days. 
Oh, and if for whatever reason you're like seven years old and have no idea who PewDiePie is, he used to be the biggest YouTuber on the entire website. And he got there by yelling like an idiot at the camera while playing Happy Wheels and Amnesia. And a bunch of other shit. And if you don't know what at least one of those games are, I'm afraid there's no saving you at this point. Please just click off the video. <laughs> don't actually click on the video. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Back then, he was also very linked to other popular YouTubers in the same field as him, such as Markiplier and Jacksepticeye. I promise this will be important later, so keep that in the back of your mind if, once again, you're seven years old and didn't already know that. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, allow me to tell you about the story about how this game came to be in the first place. On November 8th, 2014, PewDiePie announced his very own Game Jam, which is essentially just a cool event where game devs are tasked with putting together a game in a very short amount of time. The theme for the jam was Indies vs PewDiePie, which I thought meant literally nothing for the longest time, but after watching the announcement for the Game Jam, I now know that this theme is supposed to mean fun to play, but also fun to watch which is actually a pretty sick idea for a game jam themed around a Let's Play YouTuber. So developers went to work and crafted games for this game jam. One of the many devs who decided to take a crack at the game jam was Outer Minds, a small indie studio right here in Canada. They had made one other random game before this called Tadpole Tap, but other than that, the studio was pretty new. The game that Outer Minds put together for the game jam was called PewDiePie's Paradise Island, which was a little short 2D platformer where you needed to wait for a helicopter to save you from an island and survive from an onslaught of enemies coming at you. There's more to talk about in regards to this game, but I don't think it'll hit the same now as it will when I talk about it much later. So we'll just put this game jam entry on the back burner for now. Remind me to flip it over in a couple minutes so it doesn't burn to a crisp and become super annoying later. Anyway, you may be expecting me to say that this game won the game jam, and that's how the ball started rolling on the eventual full game. And you'd be right, PewDiePie's Paradise Island got first place. Wait, no, my bad. It actually didn't even get in the top three. Oops! <laughs> so yeah, to the shock of me at least, PewDiePie's Paradise Island didn't even win or get top three in the game jam. So what the hell happened here? Well, the website for PewDiePie vs. Indies, which was actually hosted on Game Jolt, is no longer available to check out to my knowledge. However, PewDiePie did upload a video of him playing the top 10 winners of the game jam. From the bits and pieces of the site we can see in the video, it looks like the entries were actually voted on by not PewDiePie, but random people who went on the website. This may explain how whatever the fuck this is got second place. The first place winner, Lord of the Horde, does actually look quite cool though, so I can't really blame the people for snubbing Paradise Island that much. However, while we're on the topic of this video where Pewds plays the top 10 games, one of the games he mentions but doesn't actually play in this video is Paradise Island. He says that he already played it beforehand in a video that would be going up later, but you can search that entire goddamn channel and you will not find the video he's referring to here. That's right, the video where PewDiePie actually plays Paradise Island was deleted off his channel for pretty much no reason as far as I can tell. It's not like he has bad blood with Outer Minds or something, far from it, so I don't think it has anything to do with Paradise Island itself. Maybe it's because the thumbnail of said delete video is a naked ass, but who really knows, you know? But yeah, thankfully the video has been archived and it's still possible to watch Pewds play Paradise Island for the very first time. And surprise surprise, he enjoyed it. Here's where shit actually gets crazy. Like we're about to jump from zero to fucking 100 here in terms of game development time, and I promise you, in an instant, you will witness this whole ass game be finished in front of your eyes. The top 10 games from the Game Jam were showcased on PewDiePie's channel on the 7th of December, 2014. On the 18th of December, 2014, PewDiePie uploaded a video called Let's Make a Game. In this video, PewDiePie announced that a PewDiePie game was officially in development by the people over at Outer Minds. The video features him asking the audience what they want to see from the game, along with showing some of the super early footage of the project. This whole thing was set up in less than a month, which is just genuinely insane to me. It's common for Game Jam games to become full games eventually, but in this case in particular, it's just so wild. Outer Minds are clearly fast workers, and Paradise Island was a great entry to a great Game Jam, so if anyone was up to the task, it was these guys. A few months later, the game was shown off again in a much more complete looking state. Some early versions of levels were shown alongside what would eventually become the world map for the game. Outer Minds would upload videos on their own channel as well, going over some frequently asked questions and giving small development updates about the game. They even revealed a whole bunch of stuff over on their Twitter, such as what playable characters would be featured in the game. As you could probably guess, said playable characters are all the other YouTubers who were closely linked to PewDiePie at the time. We got PewDiePie himself, Marzia, Mark and Jack who I mentioned earlier, Cinnamon Toast Ken, and finally... You. You. Not even a year after the game was first confirmed to be happening, on September 24th, 2015, PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist was officially released. Jesus Christ. Listen, 
This isn't like the longest game in the world or anything, right? You can sit down and beat it in like a few hours tops. But even with the shorter length aside, the amount of effort this must have taken to get this game out in less than a year is something you just have to respect. There were so many changes as well for a game made so fast. The world map looks almost completely different in that early dev look on PewDiePie's channel. They must have seriously been putting their all into getting this damn thing out. The game was released exclusively on mobile at first, but eventually got ports to Steam and other random things like smart TVs for some reason. My very first memories of playing Legend of the Brofist are of the original mobile version. And while I didn't end up playing it for this video, I do remember those controls working quite well, especially for the type of game it is. I played the Steam release for this deep dive, and I think that's the definitive way to play the game. Nothing beats playing a 2D platformer on an actual controller. Like, if you want to play it with a TV remote as if you were controlling a fucking Shrek 2 DVD menu, be my guest, but I'm sticking with good old John Xbox over here. Well, that's pretty much all the background you need to know about Legend of the Brofist. Now that that's out of the way, we can begin to talk about the main course, the full release of the game. I thought for a while how I would try to structure the main part of this video, and here's what I've settled on. I'm going to cover this game level by level, which may sound tedious at first, but there's actually only 28 levels in the entire game. All of these levels are relatively short as well, so going over things like this should be fine. However, there are obviously things I want to talk about from this game outside of the levels, so I'll be taking small breaks every now and then in between levels to talk about other aspects of the game. Got it? Good, because you're gonna be here for a while. Remember when I said to strap in earlier? I'm gonna need you to go on Amazon, buy another seatbelt, and strap in again. This one is a double strap-in scenario. Alright, without further delay, allow me to bring you on a journey as we take a complete look at PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist. Man, the title screen is easily one of the most nostalgic aspects about this game. The epic music, the logo crashing down, the Christmas tree- Wait, why the fuck is there a Christmas tree here? Okay, so since I recorded the gameplay for this game in December, the title screen actually has an alternate version for when you're playing around Christmas time. This means I have no footage of the normal title screen, but I'm sure Alice can steal some other random footage and plop it here so you guys can see the original title screen. Ah, there we go. Okay, now get that shit out of here. We have a game to yap about. There's really nothing else of note on the title screen, other than the fact that if you wait long enough, one of the dogs starts farting and the rap cloud slowly flies into the- Okay, we're moving on now. So, the game immediately throws us into the first level upon starting a new save file. And hey, look at that. This game has full voice acting. Great, a new video to upload. Hmm, I wonder how many views my last video got. What? Zero? That's weird. We'll talk about the specifics of this more later and how the full voice acting is kind of hilarious in some backwards ways, but for now, it's cool that it was done in the first place. Just another layer of effort that definitely wasn't necessary, but Outer Minds did it anyway. The story of Legend of the Brofist kicks off with PewDiePie finishing up recording one of his iconic YouTube videos. Or should I say, PewTube, because apparently YouTube doesn't exist in this universe. I like to imagine this is some dark timeline where when PewDiePie became the biggest YouTuber, he just like, bought the whole ass site for some reason and changed literally nothing about how it runs as a company, other than changing the name. Speaking of PewTube, Pew's latest video, How to Make Bread Using Your Butt Cheeks Part 1, somehow has zero views, despite him watching the video himself. So it should have default one view, but we'll just ignore that. Oh, and there's a cute reference to the Outer Minds Twitter on the recommended video sidebar as well. They used to do Spoiler Fridays, where they would show off parts of the game while it was being worked on, and I just really think that's a neat thing to throw in there. Oh yeah, I should also probably mention that literally every other video here is related to barrels. I think some of the most fun I will have making this video is going to be trying to explain random 2013 PewDiePie lore from the perspective of someone who didn't even watch PewDiePie all that much. Yeah, despite me playing this game as a kid for some reason, I was never like, actually a PewDiePie fan. I have probably spent more time playing this game than watching PewDiePie content, so a very special thanks to the PewDiePie wiki for literally being the greatest resource for someone in my position. So now, I'm going to quickly try to explain this whole barrels thing to you. As you may know, PewDiePie was very well known for playing a game called Amnesia back in the day. Amnesia had these custom story things that people could make, and a lot of Pew's content at the time was him playing through those custom stories. In the custom story called Amnesia Abduction that he played on his channel, PewDiePie would make comments about the barrels in the environment, eventually leading to him using them to take cover while hiding from a monster. This would end up backfiring on him, and he lost at the end of the video. The barrels had betrayed PewDiePie. This then kicked off a saga of barrels being a running meme on his channel, with people making Amnesia custom stories specifically for PewDiePie that featured Barreled as a threat prominently. This also includes King Barrel, another character who will show up quite soon in Legend of the Brofist. 
Hopefully that made sense and didn't sound like I was having a fucking aneurysm. <laughs> I feel like a caveman trying to explain to other cavemen how I created fire. Like, you just gotta listen to me, man. I'm speaking facts. Anyway, a barrel barges into PewDiePie's house, and a small cutscene is played showing you right away how to deal with enemies in this game. Jumping on their head. This may seem like a very obvious way of taking out enemies in a 2D platformer, and to that I say, say that to the small children who had to play Mario 2 in the 80s. They learned the hard way. Or better yet, tell that to the people who played PewDiePie's Paradise Island, a game where trying to jump on something will not result in you killing them, but instead, them killing you. So yeah, showing the player immediately that this is how you deal with barrels and other enemies was absolutely a good call. Especially because jumping on enemies is genuinely a really core part of this game's level design. But we'll talk about that in a bit. One last thing about this opening before we talk about the actual first level. All the barrels in this game are just voiced by random Outer Minds employees, as far as I can tell. And knowing that fact makes their questionable performances about 20 times more charming. <laughs> all your fans are belong to us. And now, it's your turn to be contained. You damn barrels, you'll never capture me. Contain, contain. Anyway, let's take a look at the very first level that Legend of the Brofist has to offer. Level 1, House. Legend of the Brofist is split up into three main level types for the majority of the game. There are what I like to call find and survive levels, where you need to either find a certain amount of things to end the level, or survive as long as possible while waiting for a time limit to end. Said time limit is typically something coming to pick you up and take you away from the arena you're trapped in, whether it be a helicopter or a train. We'll talk about the other types of levels when we get there, but for now, all you need to know is that this first level falls into the find and survive category. I think starting the game off like this was a really smart choice. It gives the player a large area to mess around in, in order to get used to the controls and such. PewDiePie has pretty standard 2D platformer controls. You can move left and right, duck to avoid oncoming danger, and of course, you can jump. There are two special abilities you can do as well, but at this point in the game, you can't do any. Legend of the Brofist uses a heart system for damage. If you get hit, you lose a heart. Pretty simple. This level tasks you to run around and grab all of PewDiePie's shit he needs before he can truly set off on his adventure. An arrow will point you in the direction of where said shit is, and you need to go and grab all of it in order to complete the level. Pretty simple concept, but I genuinely believe that this is one of the best first levels in a 2D platformer, when it comes to teaching the player how the game works. The stuff that you need to grab, it's buried under piles of clothing. All you need to do is stand in front of the piles and your character will automatically start digging. After a few seconds, the thing you're looking for will be retrieved from the pile, and you can move on. This digging up piles mechanic isn't just a one-off gimmick for this level. It's something you can do in pretty much every single level of the game. Extra hearts and coins can also be hidden in these piles, which can come up in all sorts of forms, not just clothing. Even the first level teaches you this, having multiple piles of leaves in the same style as the clothing piles around the outside areas of the house. You can dig these up the same exact way, and earn more rewards by doing so. However, just because you're digging, does not mean you're safe from the enemies and other dangers around you. Managing your character while trying to dig something up will be a constant battle as we continue further in the game. Legend of the Brofist is obviously aware of this fact, so to make things fair, any progress you made on a dig pile will stay even if you have to stop digging to kill an enemy or dodge something. So you're free to make some digging progress, protect yourself, then go back to digging to finish whatever else you have left. It's a really clever system that may have felt unfair at times if this mechanic wasn't put into place. While we're on the topic of these digging piles, I should probably talk more about what's inside these digging piles. I already mentioned that you can get extra hearts and coins from these, but let's talk a little bit more about coins. Coins, as you can probably see, are collectibles scattered around the levels that you can just simply pick up Mario style. These coins actually have a purpose as well. You can use them to buy new characters, abilities, and even increase the health bar. Sounds cool, right? Nope! I fucking hate this system! It won't make sense now, so I won't bother getting into it, but here, I'll give you an IOU for a money system rant in this game later in the video. The last, and arguably most important thing you can get from these dig piles are patches. Patches don't actually do anything, but they serve as a neat collectible you can go out of your way to pick up for completion's sake. There is a reward for going out of your way to collect all of them as well, so don't think they're entirely pointless. I love the house as a first level, because it very naturally shows the player how the mechanics of the game work without even trying. For instance, one of those patches I just mentioned? The only way to get it is to somehow get all the way up this little section on the left side of the house by the garage area. At first, it seems impossible to reach. Jumping down from the house through the electricity pole isn't a viable option, and there's no open rooms inside the house that are connected to it. This is how the game teaches you one of the most important aspects of its gameplay. Enemy bouncing. 
In New Super Mario Bros. Wii, for example, you can use enemies to bounce slightly higher into the air. Same thing for a lot of platformers. However, this is rarely, if not ever, emphasized as a core game mechanic. It's just kind of a thing you can do if you want a little bit of extra height. In Brofist, however, enemy bouncing is a core part of the game design that will come up time and time again in the level design, whether it be for mandatory progression or finding secrets like this patch we're about to talk about. The jump in Legend of the Brofist is kind of lacking. It feels a little too short sometimes, but I think this was done by design. Because when you jump on top of an enemy and hold down the jump button while doing so, your jump height almost doubles. You get so much hype by doing this, and part of the fun is seeing how many enemies you can jump on before touching the ground again. So, to get that patch, you have to use the power of the enemy jump and use a barrel to bounce all the way up there to get some extra coins and to dig up the patch. Just like that, the player is familiar with all the controls in the game, how the collectibles work, and how the advanced controls work. They also now understand one of the core gameplay styles Legend of the Brofist has to offer. House is truly a fantastic starting level. The things you're digging up in order to end the level are PewDiePie's dogs, some random references to his channel in the form of items, and his girlfriend Marzia for some reason. Why was she stuck in a pile of clothing? What the fuck happened? Speaking of the dogs, this brings me to another core aspect of the game design the companion characters. In a lot of 2D platformers, there will be bullshit sections of game design where something will automatically kill you if you touch it in any way, whether it be the lava in 2D Mario or some other random example I can't think of right now. This is a staple in the 2D platformer genre. Legend of the Brofist is no different. There are tons of things in this game that will automatically kill you if you touch them. However, the geniuses over at Outer Minds came up with a system that not only allows you to get a second and even third chance with insta-kill obstacles, but also gives a valid reason to have smaller companion characters follow the playable characters. These companion characters are essentially just a natural expansion of your health bar, but in a way that makes you feel really bad if you mess up. Let's use PewDiePie for example. His companion characters are his pugs, Maya and Edgar. Some characters only have one companion that can take two hits, while others have two that can only take one hit each. But the mechanic stays the same regardless of who you're playing as. Okay, let's say you're at full health, but accidentally mess up a jump and fall directly onto an insta-kill object or environment piece. Instead of you actually dying right then and there, one of the two companions will swoop in and take the hit for you blowing up into a million bloody pieces. It even does a whole slow-mo zoom-in thing as well, and it is very sad and makes you feel very bad. <laughs> this same effect will also kick in if you're on your last heart, but still have your companions. They will swoop in to take the hit for you. This gives you an extra lifeline and allows you to quickly fix any mistakes you may have made, and I think it's genuinely a really cool mechanic for this game. Especially for how difficult Legend of the Brofist can be at times, having that extra hit or two can really be the difference between winning and losing a level. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, but I'm trying my best to be as thorough as possible while covering this game. If you wanted a quick 20 minute summary, I'm sure someone else has made that, but that isn't what this video is, buddy. We're going all in. In fact, I have another tangent I want to go on within this tangent. The fact that PewDiePie's dogs were so well known, so popular, that they got essentially a starring role in this game is such an old YouTube thing, you know? Like, I can't think of that many YouTubers now where their pets are like almost an integral part of their brand. If someone made an uh yeah video game, I wouldn't expect them to use my cats in it, because why would you? My cats aren't part of my content. Probably like 1% of my audience even knows my cats exist. Here's a video of my cats playing PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist. Look, Izzy, it's PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist. Yeah! Isn't that awesome? What's your thoughts? Never mind. Huh. I wonder how easy it is to mod this game. I have two pets, PewDiePie has two pets. Kinda writes itself. Anyway, the barrels in this level will endlessly spawn through a variety of holes they create in the walls throughout the house, which serve as an annoyance while you're trying to collect everything in order to leave. This introduces us to a variety of different barrel types, such as standard ones, the rolling ones, and the pregnant ones. Very normal game. Actually, these pregnant barrels really bring up the morals of endlessly murdering an entire species, but they did steal your YouTube subscribers, so who gives a shit? Kill them all! One last thing I need to mention before we move on from this level is the music. You've definitely been hearing it in the background of this video the entire time, but I've also used it in plenty of videos in the past. One, as an easter egg that this video was coming, but two, because this OST genuinely slaps so incredibly hard. It's one of my favorites of all time for sure, and I wanted to make sure to give extra spotlight to it during this video, when the level has especially good music accompanying it. 
House is one of many levels with an incredibly good song, and it's definitely one of the first songs I think about whenever I want to listen to this OST. I'm not really a music guy, so I can't exactly explain to you why these songs are so good, so instead, I'm just gonna play bits and pieces of songs whenever I think they are certified bangers. Anyway, take a listen to this heat right now. Good, isn't it? The last thing I'd expect from a 2015 made in a few months PewDiePie tie-in game is a banger soundtrack, but the madman behind it all, RushJet1, really pulled it off. As you may have been able to guess from their name, RushJet1 does a lot of Mega Man remixes, and the soundtrack of this game absolutely shows that influence. Although, I'd personally say that this game has a better soundtrack than pretty much any Mega Man game. Although I'm aware that's probably extremely controversial. And to the two Mega Man fans in my audience, I am truly sorry. Once all the items have been collected, you need to make your way over to the car in order to get the hell out of there. However, before you can leave, you receive a call from none other than King Barrel himself, who is also voiced by PewDiePie, which is really funny. <laughs> King Barrel says that he has captured all of PewDiePie's subscribers and will soon have the power of the legendary Brofist. Then Marzia speaks. Okay, we need to talk about these talking sprites. PewDiePie? Looks great, no issues. All the enemies also look great. Even the one who we are not going to talk about yet that looks like Dream has a fine character sprite. But every single other human in this game has a very interesting talking sprite. <laughs> they look almost traced off existing images or something. They are incredibly uncanny. All of them have significantly smaller, more realistic eyes, while PewDiePie was given these bigger, more expressive cartoony eyes. I truly believe that a lot of these sprites for the dialogue were just thrown together in a day, because I mean, who really cares? And plus, they look extremely funny out of context, so all is good in the world. I wouldn't change it for a thing. I think the Markiplier one is my personal favorite. He looks so... Interesting. Putting that tangent aside, the scene is now set. PewDiePie must travel across the world to confront King Barrel in order to save his fans and stop him from using the power of the legendary Brofist. Whatever that is. Not even PewDiePie knows what that fucking thing is. King Barrel could just be lying to him and he wouldn't even know. But forget about that. There are adventures to be had, and with that, level one comes to a close. Kind of, but we'll talk about that in a second. The results screen isn't too interesting, but there is some stuff to note regarding coins. Depending on how well you do in a level, such as taking no damage or having your companions alive, you're rewarded with extra coins to spend during the game. It's a nice bonus, but unless you're playing on the harder difficulties, where coin multipliers come into play here, it really isn't anything that noteworthy. Now, if you could take your eyes away from PewDiePie twerking in the bottom left corner, you may notice a snapshot of the level we just talked about. This is Snappy, one of the weirdest mechanics in this entire game. Essentially, at random points during a level, Snappy will hatch from an egg somewhere on screen and take a random picture of whatever you're doing. Listen, it's a cute idea, but who the fuck is like, yes, this picture of PewDiePie running away from his wife down the stairs is perfect for my Twitter account. Okay, never mind, that's actually kind of funny. But normally, these pictures are just really dumb and are just random ass moments from the level you played. These pictures also say what difficulty you're playing on, and it's about time I finally address that, I think. I've been mentioning other difficulties during this video, but upon starting a new game, you were forced to play the first level on easy mode. As far as I can tell, there's no way to pick your difficulty right from the start. This is because, in this game, you can change what difficulty you're playing on at any time. Because of this, if you end up playing this game, you may want to go back to replay the first level again on a harder difficulty. Here's why you don't do that. Hard mode is actually fine for the most part. It adds a few more things you need to pick up around the house, some harder enemies spawn in, and you take two hearts per hit instead of one. However, the bro difficulty, especially on a first playthrough with no extra hearts bought, is a fucking nightmare. What was once a perfect level to teach the player the game becomes a shining example of one of Legend of the Brofist's core problems, specifically with these find and survive levels. Not only do you have even more shit to pick up now, not only do you take four hearts of damage if you get hit, but the enemy spawning genuinely becomes archaic. On bro difficulty, the game will start to spawn in as many enemies as possible essentially, with even more coming from the walls and the variety being much greater as well. For example, 
The TNT barrels are one of the most annoying enemies to deal with in the late game, and they just get plopped into the first level here, mixed with a million other non-stop spawning enemies that you have to deal with while having a very limited amount of hits. This becomes much, much easier once you buy hearts and have special abilities later in the game, but as a first playthrough, this is horrible. The amount of enemies that spawn here feels straight up unfair at times, and you're often put into situations where it feels almost impossible to dodge everything coming at you. I think the best difficulty to play this game on is probably hard. Easy is a bit of a cakewalk, and bro is just not fun until you have more defenses you can use, so my recommended way to play through this game is first playing on hard mode, then replaying the game on bro mode once you have a shit ton of upgrades. Now, there's one last difficulty we haven't talked about, but that isn't unlocked until you beat a level on bro mode, so we'll leave it for now and come back to it later. I have a bit to say about it. Now that we're actually done talking about level 1, let's go over the stuff you can do on the world map, starting with, well, the world map itself. The pixel art for this thing is really good, and other than some weird level placements that we'll get into later, I think it's a really solid world map. However, you can't talk about this world map without bringing up probably the most iconic part of it. The goddamn music. Rushjet 1 did it again, everybody. This shit is genuinely so good. It's a short loop, but it really gives off that sense of a grand adventure. I love this track so much, guys. <laughs> Next up is the pants menu. This is where you can buy characters as you unlock them, buy different power-ups, and view all the patches you've collected so far. It's a really cozy menu system, but for reasons you'll find out later, I kind of have a problem with how a lot of the stuff is set up here. We'll get into that when we have more characters though. For now, we can talk about what becomes unlocked after beating that first level. The big one is the first new playable character, Marzia. Why are you here? <laughs> At the end of the last level, she literally says she was happy he was gone and that she could just eat snacks all day, Nikikado mukbang style. Why are you so eager to help now, huh? I would say it's probably not worth playing as this character, like, ever. She doesn't have any unique companions, just being the same as PewDiePie's, and her one unique ability is kind of mid. Yes, you heard me right, unique abilities. Not every character can use every power-up you buy, and some have a power-up that only they can use. We'll talk about Marzia's unique ability once it actually unlocks later in the game, but we actually have two different purchasable abilities that we can talk about right now. The first of these is Edgar Fart. This ability is alright. It causes Edgar to fart a huge cloud that will kill anything that tries to go inside of it. It's kind of a situational ability, and there are some similar ones later on that essentially make this one useless, but as an early game thing, it's fine. The next one though, they literally give you one of the best abilities right off the bat. Dr. Crab Healing. All this one does is give you three hearts upon using it, and it is so insanely useful for the entire game. A lot of the other defense options are just like, a little bit of invincibility for a second or so, and they feel kind of weird to use half the time, because you never really know when to use it. And when it's done, you're just left as vulnerable as before. But with this, you can time it at any time to get some quick heart recovery and get yourself out of countless shitty situations. When I did my bro mode playthrough, I literally only used this as my defensive option. There's another ability you can unlock later that could potentially give Dr. Crab a run for his money, but I still personally think he's better, and we'll talk about that when it comes up. These abilities will be usable at the start of a level, and you can equip two at once. The catch is, one has to be an offensive one, and the other has to be a defensive one. Once used in a level, you will have to recharge them to be able to use them again. Recharging an ability is as easy as doing anything. Picking up coins, killing enemies, even taking damage. All these things will slowly fill up the ability back to being usable again. I think this is a really great system, especially for the fact that taking damage fills up the meters. Obviously, you want to avoid taking damage at all times, but if you're in a particularly rough spot and getting your ass handed to you, knowing that each heart you lose could help you get one step closer to being able to save yourself with an ability is really cool. Okay, 16 pages into writing this beast of a video, and we can finally move on to level 2, Highway Frenzy. This level features the second out of three core gameplay styles that Legend of the Brofist has to offer. That being standard platforming levels. 
These are your typical left to right side scrollers that most of you are probably already used to. Like you've seen gameplay of fucking Mario Brothers before, you know what we're talking about here. These levels still have all the things from the find and survive levels, such as digging piles and patches, but the new objective is to make it to the end of the level and reach the golden flag. On easy and hard difficulties, these levels will also feature checkpoints, sometimes more than one even. Just another reason that playing this on bro mode for your first playthrough is probably not a good idea, some of these sections can be kind of tricky the first time around, and having to replay an entire level every time you mess up isn't the most fun thing in the world, especially on your first run of something. Highway Frenzy picks up right where we left off, with PewDiePie escaping his house in his car. The first boss of the game, General Barrel, has been called in to stop PewDiePie with his giant ass tank, and this level features you jumping from car to car as General Barrel blows up all the cars behind you. This means you can't just stop and stick around on any of these cars for long. If you're on a car that General Barrel explodes with his tank, you'll not only take damage, but be thrown right onto the road, which inflicts insta-kill damage. Of course, you have your companions with you. So if you want to throw your dogs onto a highway going really fast to save your own life, that's an option as well. This level sets up the first of what I like to call orcs in this game. An arc in Legend of the Brofist usually starts with a level that introduces a certain theme or boss to look out for, and ends with you finally confronting said boss and moving on in the game. This is the shortest of these arcs in the game, only spanning two levels, but future arcs will feature more levels and more characters to meet along the way. And speaking of bosses, I have here written in my notes for some reason, this level made me realize that the barrels essentially just want to vor people, which I'm not exactly sure why I wrote that, but I'm pretty sure it has to do with the barrels being really obsessed with quote unquote containing people. Like they don't want to eat you or anything, they just really want you to stand inside them as they go about their day to day lives. And is there really anything truly wrong with that? Once again, and I promise I won't do this for every level, the music here is top notch. The urgency of this setting, caused by General Barrel being hot in your trail and blowing up all your old, once safe car platforms, is perfectly represented in this track. Which yeah. This is a great level, and one of the first levels I think about when I think of this game. As much as I like it though, maybe it's kind of weird as a second level. From a story perspective, it makes sense, but having your first normal platforming level be this fast-paced chase scene where touching the ground is an insta-kill is a little bit strange. There's a level we'll talk about a little bit later called Nostalgia Skies that I think may have served as a better introduction into the standard platforming stuff, but even then that level has some tricky bits and could potentially even be a little trickier than Highway Frenzy, I'm not quite sure. So yeah, great level, but I can't help but feel that this might have been a little misplaced in the game's order. Although, I do have to give credit to this level for showing off how the companion system works significantly better than the first level. This makes sense since you don't even have the companions until you dig them up in that level, but yeah, I thought I should at least mention that. Besides that though, this level has a lot of cool sections that are worth discussing. For starters, since you're pretty much on a time limit for every car or truck you stand on, getting some of those patches can make you really feel like you're cutting it close. Like sometimes on this level, you'll just finish up digging a patch right before General Barrel blows up the car said patch was on. And it's a thrilling experience getting out of a situation like that unharmed. There's also this section near the end of the level where a car takes a while to catch up to the next car you need to get to, and on that car, there's two different barrels shooting energy blasts your way. You have to dodge those energy blasts while you wait for the car to catch up so you can bounce on the barrels and continue forward. This section actually brings up another core design philosophy we will see a lot throughout this game, that being wait and survive. There are tons of sections just like this one where you need to wait on a platform to make progress in the level and while you're waiting there will be a series of threats that you have to avoid. These allow you to take a break from the fast paced momentum of the platforming stages while also not making your breaks too easy and keeping your fingers warmed up for the next section of the level. This design philosophy is also carried over into the find and survive style of levels which are literally just this same concept on a larger scale. When you went into a video about a fucking PewDiePie game, were you really expecting an in-depth analysis on game design elements? because I sure as hell wasn't, but here we are now. Anyway, getting to the end of Highway Frenzy leaves PewDiePie at a dead end with no more cars to jump on and General Barrel finally catching up to him. 
things are looking grim, when all of a sudden, fucking Markiplier calls you. Somehow he just knows you're in danger and brings down his private jet to save you. So that's where all the FNAF money went, huh? Truly one of the greatest scenes in any video game ever. PewDiePie does a dirt face, they steal a joke from Fairly Odd Parents of all places, you know the one where Timmy just explains every weird thing he has to his parents by saying he got it off the internet. Yeah, they use that joke and make it essentially Markiplier's entire personality in this game, and I have no idea why. And with that, the level comes to a close as General Barrel says that you haven't seen the last of him. Anyway, on to the next level where General Barrel fucking dies. No new abilities or characters to unlock yet, so without further delay, we're cruising on over to level 3, Jet Frenzy. This level is not a find and survive level, or a standard platforming level. But here's the kicker, it's not the third level type I talked about either, which is, spoiler alert, boss fight levels. No, this is a plain level. So you're probably wondering why I said there's three level types and not four, when this is clearly the fourth level type. And to that I say, this is the only plain level in the entire game. Listen, I get that platformers need some sort of variety to keep them interesting, but why is this the third level if the concept is never brought up again? Throw it in the middle of the map or something. Why is this one of the first levels you play? All that knowledge you just picked up from the last two levels, throw it away, I guess. You could potentially argue that this is a boss level, but regardless, it is the only level in the entire game to play like this, and obviously none of the other boss levels are like this. Even weirder, while the other bosses in the game get their own dedicated levels for their fights, hence why I said it's a level type, Jet Frenzy is the only level in the entire game to feature both a full level and a full boss fight all inside of one level. This doesn't really matter that much on difficulties with checkpoints, since there is a checkpoint right before the boss, but on the hardest two difficulties in the entire game, you have no checkpoints and are forced to beat this whole ass level and whole ass boss fight in one go. If you die during the boss fight, too bad. You have to play this dumbass level again. Have fun. <laughs> in my notes for this video, I have each level listed in order of appearance, and I have a small thing beside each level to quickly tell me what type of level it is. And next to this one, I just have written down the fucking plane level. So I guess we should actually talk about this fucking plane level now. The level starts with PewDiePie and Markiplier inside of his private jet that we ended up on at the end of Highway Frenzy. This doesn't last long though, as Markiplier says jet fuel is expensive and we need to hitch a ride on the tiny plane that he just has on hand inside of his private jet for some reason. He also conveniently had two even smaller planes for his dog somehow, Burn really thought of everything. Anyway, the controls here are very simple. You use the joystick or d-pad to move around anywhere on screen, and hold down a button to constantly shoot out a stream of bullets. Abilities don't work here, so after being able to use them for a single level, we already have to forget about them. Very cool level placement, guys. The actual level portion of this level is very whatever. It essentially just boils down to enemy spam on a single screen for a few minutes while you try to make your way to the boss. There's no patches or any sort of secret areas, it's really just a singular screen that you have to move forward on with nothing super interesting going on. There's these barrels and planes that will shoot homing missiles at you, which are super fucking annoying. But other than that, the rest of the enemies are insanely easy to deal with. I also can't talk about this level without mentioning the giant ass whale that drops from the sky. If you get crushed by it, you automatically die but you can also use it to your advantage by dodging it, which causes it to destroy other enemies it hits on the way down. This is genuinely super useful, especially on this level where enemy spam can become kind of overwhelming at specific points. Jet Frenzy also does a good job at showing one of my favorite details about this game, things blowing up into a million bloody pieces. You've probably noticed it from gameplay so far, but pretty much every single enemy, companion, and playable character blows up into a million pieces upon dying which is a very funny touch. The unicorns that fly by at points in this level are fairly large, so it's easy to see them blow up upon killing them here. While the actual level isn't very noteworthy, the boss fight against General Barrel is a lot more fun in my opinion. I think my only real complaint here is that this boss fight comes a little too early in the game and this arc is way too short compared to every other one we'll see later on. Gonna bring up Nostalgia Skies again, that level probably could have gone after Highway Frenzy and it would have made the build up to General Barrel feel a lot more impactful than it ends up being, just because it goes by way too fast. I think it would make sense to have the game structured like this anyway, since Nostalgia Skies comes after this level, so swapping them around and having Markiplier drop you off at the start of Nostalgia Skies instead of here would have made sense. I feel like I'm the only person on the planet who cares about this issue, but whatever, ranting is fun, leave me alone. So the boss fight, what's that about? Well, General Barrel's tank from earlier apparently had the ability to fucking fly the whole time, which may have been really useful to him in the last level, just saying. 
The tank isn't just one big target to shoot at, like a Cuphead boss or something. Instead, each phase of the fight has you specifically targeting and breaking parts of the tank to then eventually destroy it. Each phase has slightly different attacks, and the whole thing feels way more fun than the level that came before it. I still think this whole plane thing being in the game is very weird, but this fight almost makes up for it. Almost. Once General Barrel's tank has been defeated, he mentions that his brother in the North Pole will avenge him, ending this arc short and kicking off the next arc in the game, the General Barrel arc. Which may sound confusing just hearing me say it, since you're probably like, what do you mean, didn't we just kill General Barrel? And yes, we did. This is his brother, General Barrel. Get it? Because he's one of the blue rolling barrels? It's a good joke. Made me lol. After the results screen, there's a short cutscene that's pretty funny. Like I'm gonna get out of this awesome plane. Stupid video game rules. Guess it's on foot from now on. And with that, we move on to the next level. But before we can do that, we have some new unlocks to talk about. This includes our next playable character, the man, the myth, the legend, Markiplier. This also brings me to my IOU rant about the shitty money system in this game that I promised I would do earlier. Because holy shit, this system is so insanely flawed and almost feels anti-fun at times. Like, I swear to God. Let's start here. You do not get that much money in this game playing on easy or hard difficulties. On the higher difficulties, this is less of a problem, but you'll remember from earlier that I said bro difficulty is not a reasonable way to play through this game on your first try. Even with that in mind, I don't think the coin difference would be big enough between the two for this to still not be an issue. The main problem really boils down to this. You do not make enough money in this game to warrant trying to buy and play as every character. And the game almost feels designed that way for some reason. For example, the heart system. Having it so every single character has to have their hearts upgraded individually makes it so with the limited amount of money you have playing this game, it is essentially discouraged to play as more than one character. Because if I spend all my money on PewDiePie to raise his hearts up, why would I ever bother to play as the other characters when the one character I'm spending my money on is just going to be significantly better than everyone else? I think that the heart system should have been a universal one that upgraded the hearts of every character at the same time. Then character swapping would be a much more viable way to run this game. What's the fun in playing a game like this with all these cool YouTubers and a creepy loser when you're actively discouraged from playing as all of them? I did my first run of this video trying to play as everybody at least a couple times, and I was actively putting myself in a worse position doing so. All of my characters had almost no heart upgrades, and even then, I couldn't afford all the character exclusive abilities that make using these extra characters fun in the first place. Ah yes, the character exclusive abilities, another part of the system that actively discourages you from using multiple characters. These things are hella expensive. So it's just significantly more smart to focus on one character the whole game and buy all their abilities rather than trying to cast a wide net and playing as everybody. It's so, so cool they even decided to include extra characters in the first place. But the way it's set up literally makes you grind for money to get everything. There's a level coming up later in the game called Hurry Up that takes less than a minute to beat and gives you 200 coins per run if you can beat it on bro difficulty without taking any damage or losing any companions. At least one hour of my playtime in this game was dedicated to playing this one level over and over again. Like, bitch, this isn't an RPG. I should not be grinding in my linear 2D platformer. And the cherry on top of all of this is that you have to buy the characters as well. You also have to unlock them, but to be able to play as the character you unlocked, you have to spend coins that could be going towards literally anything else on a character swap. This whole thing is headache inducing. I love this game. But playing a fresh save file and having to deal with the reality of this every single time is so, so annoying. Now that we have the groundwork for this whole mess, here's how I'd fix this system. For one, characters should not cost coins. You already spend a lot buying their abilities, the only thing making them unique from PewDiePie, so having to buy the characters as well just feels unnecessary. Characters should unlock as soon as they unlock throughout the game normally, just without the price tag. Next. Health should be universal throughout the cast. Having to upgrade this for each character on their own discourages playing as the other characters, so having one dedicated place to buy health for everyone just makes more sense to me. If the cost to upgrade health each time had to be increased a bit because of it to keep things balanced, so be it. It still costs less than having to upgrade every single character on their own. And that's it. With those simple changes, you can now play as the whole cast during a story mode playthrough without any issues and your coins can be spent more efficiently on the abilities, which like I said, are the only thing making the characters unique in the first place. As it stands now, you essentially have to buy characters twice, since just buying the characters doesn't give you access to anything PewDiePie doesn't already have. The entire cast, minus one secret character, plays the exact same. 
Wow, okay. <laughs> I did not expect that tangent to go on for so long, but you can't say I didn't deliver on that IOU. With that out of the way, we can actually talk about all the stuff that becomes available for purchase at this point in the game. Like I previously said, this is where Markiplier unlocks, but the other thing that becomes available is actually the defensive ability I said could give Dr. Crab a run for his money. I'm talking about Energy Shield, which on paper should be better than Dr. Crab in every way. The concept is simple enough. You activate the shield, and if you get hit by something, you take no damage and the shield is destroyed. On Bro difficulty, where you lose 4 hearts instead of 1, this sounds like a direct upgrade, considering Dr. Crab only heals for 3 hearts. However, while you can time your usage of Dr. Crab and get your health back you lost as soon as you need it, the shield does not give you that same luxury. This is because, for some reason, if you go long enough without taking a hit, the shield just decides to disappear into thin air. This makes Dr. Crab definitively better because you will always get something out of using him, where well, there's a high chance you will get nothing out of using the shield. If the shield never disappeared, it would be better by a long shot, and I assume it was nerfed like this so Dr. Crab wasn't made completely irrelevant. But as it stands, I think Dr. Crab is just all around the better choice. Okay, now we can move on to the first level of the General Barrel arc, which I now realize is going to get really confusing if I keep saying it out loud, so instead, we're just going to call it the North Pole arc. This arc lasts seven whole levels, and kicks off with one I've already talked about quite a bit. Level 4, Nostalgia Skies. I'll try my best to keep these level breakdowns shorter than they have been, since I know we've already been here for a while. Like, feel free to take a break now, grab a bite to eat or something, but no promises from me. Apparently, I just have an ungodly amount of things to say about this PewDiePie game from 2015! Who would have guessed? <laughs> anyway, Nostalgia Skies, let's go. This level opens up with a phone call from Marzia for some reason. This will keep occasionally happening throughout the game if you play as PewDiePie, don't question it. It will probably be relevant later. I guess I should also mention now that if you're playing as someone other than PewDiePie and you enter a story cutscene, PewDiePie will just spawn from underneath whatever character you're playing as and the dialogue will continue as normal. Interesting way of getting around that, but yeah, like I said, these phone calls will only ever happen if you're playing as Pewds. Nostalgia Skies is actually part of a series of levels in the game that all share the same level theme and all have the word nostalgia at the start of the name. This extends to the music as well, which is actually another one of the best songs in the game. This song also has a really sick detail that won't be obvious until we talk about the other nostalgia levels later, so keep that in the back of your head right next to the playable character that I have refused to say the name of yet. This is a good old fashioned standard platforming level, and I think it's a really fun one at that. Nostalgia Skies does a great job at showcasing dig pile mechanics as well. If you remember from earlier, I mentioned that dig piles will keep the progress made on them if you can't finish the dig for whatever reason. This is shown directly in this level, as in order to dig up this pile, you must take breaks in between to avoid the fireballs directly headed towards said pile. Just another way the game teaches you its mechanics with very little effort. Something that Legend of the Brofist truly excels at. This level also features more examples of that wait and survive gameplay that appears in these platformer levels from time to time. There's a section where you need to wait for a cloud to come down in order to make progress in the level. And while that's happening, you can't just sit around because both ducks and fireballs are coming directly at you the whole time you're waiting. The other core gameplay mechanic, enemy bouncing, is represented in this level's branching paths. They aren't anything crazy or whatever, but there are some segments where you are rewarded for enemy bouncing up to a higher platform with things such as extra coins. This is the first platformer level in the game to do this, since the last one was pretty linear thanks to the highway theme and structure. So it's cool that the game now has enough confidence in the player to start offering slightly harder, optional challenges for better rewards. Speaking of rewards, Nostalgia Skies also features one of the hardest to notice patch locations in the entire game, at least in my opinion. There's a section where you have to jump over what you will likely think is another bottomless pit. However, if you pay attention to the bottom of the screen, you can ever so slightly make out a few enemies chilling at the very bottom. This is the green light that it's actually safe to go down there, and you're rewarded with a patch for doing so. That's pretty much it for this level, but I'd be doing a disservice to you all if I didn't mention that this level is the introduction of one of the funniest recurring enemies in the entire game. Cows. Yep, literally just fucking cows. Or at least, that's what you'll think at first. 
get too close, and they explode into multiple bloody pieces that will damage you on contact. This thing shows up a lot for some reason, and it's almost always out of place. But I think that's probably the joke, and I can't help but find it funny. With that, we are done with Nostalgia Skies. See, that pace wasn't so bad. Maybe this video won't be 20 million years long now. No unlocks after this one, so we're moving on to level 5, Abandoned Subway. The first find and survive level in a hot minute. Unlike the previous find and survive level that took place in a large house, with many places to explore and hide from enemies, Abandoned Subway takes place in a smaller area with pretty much zero vertical movement. You can go left, right, and jump on some lights that hang from the ceiling, but other than that, it's a pretty crowded level. Because of this though, it actually does quite a good job at feeling like you're in a crowded busy subway. You might be thinking that directly goes against the name of the damn level, but this is a subway abandoned by people, not monsters. This isn't your average abandoned subway, and the level lets you know that right away, with this massive fucking T-Rex being the first obstacle you're forced to deal with. Stand still and do nothing, and you'll get eaten right away. But if you run underneath it, you'll find that it's actually safe there and the T-Rex will proceed to run away and despawn. A very bold start to the level. And sure, a T-Rex doesn't really make that much sense being here whatsoever, but neither do talking barrels with an obsessive vor fetish. We've seen crazier shit at this point, guys. Get with the program. Abandoned Subway represents the other side of the find and survive levels, the survival aspect. Unlike House, you aren't tasked with finding anything. Instead, you're forced to survive as long as you can while waiting for your train to the North Pole to arrive and pick you up. Don't question why there are multiple trains picking up people in an abandoned subway, and don't question how a train can even get to the North Pole. We're moving on. <laughs> the new enemies seen in this level are actually really great. You have these big piles of flesh that are a bit tricky to deal with thanks to the projectile vomit that goes in an arc formation, and these huge sewer rats with explosives strapped onto them that will explode into multiple pieces upon getting close enough to you. These are actually quite easy to dodge, even when multiple run up to you at once, but it's still a pretty cool enemy concept. And we can't talk about this level without talking about these shadow demon things. To keep things interesting, and to not allow the player to just stay in one spot the whole time, occasionally during the level, you'll be notified of something coming from either the left, right, or both sides at once. These are the shadow demons, and as they move closer to one side or the other, everything behind them will become dark, and will also kill all enemies inside of said darkness. This danger also applies to you as well, since if you stay in this darkness for any period of time, you'll take damage as well. This forces you to run to the other side of the screen, and wait for the shadow demon to despawn. If they're coming from both sides, all you have to do is go to the middle, and you'll be safe. This level element really makes the whole thing feel way more interesting to play, and I found myself strategizing around when I thought the demons would spawn. It keeps the player on their toes, and forces you to move around and confront certain dangers, whether you like it or not. The only real problem this level falls into are really only apparent on difficulties where the hearts and healing options are sparse. That being the constant enemy spam. It actually isn't as bad here as it is on the first level, but still, I think this game could have benefited from these levels having a set structure of enemies to deal with, rather than pure randomization. It would definitely make the player feel like they're learning more from attempt to attempt than they currently do with this enemy randomization approach. This level never really gives me that much trouble anymore, but I also wonder if this level might be a bit tricky for where it's placed in the game. Although on that note, you could just switch difficulty on the fly anyway, so it's not really a big deal. All around, this is a pretty decent level, with a really cool visual aesthetic. Once the train to the North Pole finally arrives, you have to make your way over to the entrance without dying in order to end the level and continue onwards. Not before another ability becomes available to purchase, Myoride. This is Marzia's exclusive ability that I mentioned earlier, and it's pretty bad. You move faster, jump higher, and are invincible for a very short period of time, but I can't really think of a level where this would even be super useful, and honestly, it feels like a waste of a slot, especially since it counts as a defense option and would remove your ability to heal using Dr. Crab. There are many other abilities later in the game for other characters that do pretty much the exact same thing, but give you more control, so overall, I don't think this ability is really worth buying unless you're truly trying to complete the game. With that out of the way, let's talk about level 6, Glaciers. After the train hits a dead end in the middle of the North Pole for some reason, PewDiePie is left to fend for himself in this new, snowy environment. This is also where General Barrel finally shows himself for the first time in his own arc by means of a phone call. He reveals that he has captured Shannon, and if you don't know who that is, don't worry, because it's time for another trip over to the PewDiePie fan wiki. Shannon is a shark that PewDiePie met in his playthrough of a game called The Forest, which I've never heard of before, but it has Shannon in it, so it must be good. The wiki goes on to describe her as a drunk, which was a fucking shock to me, because this characterization is pretty much completely absent in Legend of the Brofist. The wiki has one single picture of Shannon, and it's of her dead stranded on a beach. Great, let's move on. Glaciers is another standard platforming level. 
However, it introduces us to one of the main gimmicks in this section of the game. Ice physics. Ice physics in 2D platformers can kind of be annoying sometimes, but if done right, you can easily make it work, and even create a lot of interesting challenges around that added factor. I'm happy to report that I think Legend of the Brofist does a good job handling the ice physics, and these upcoming levels are in no way hindered by the inclusion of them. Glaciers does a great job at rewarding players who learn to use the physics to their advantage as well. There will be these sections where you can either go on top of a snowy platform or slide underneath using the ice while avoiding spikes and getting extra coins. These will soon become mandatory, but it's cool that in their first appearance, you're actively rewarded with taking the more risky option of sliding underneath the spikes. I think just the nature of physics like this as well encourages the player to get better at enemy bouncing, since the less time spent on the ground, the better in certain situations. Even a section right at the end of the level where you need to enemy bounce to reach the golden flag to finish the level, which I thought was a great touch. Here I also want to talk about the level of interactivity with the environment these next couple levels have, because it's genuinely really sick. So as you all have probably noticed just by watching the footage already, this level features a bunch of water, but don't think it's safe to jump into. We're in the fucking North Pole after all. Jumping into this water will freeze you to death and instantly deal insta-kill damage, so you want to do your best to avoid it at all costs. However, the cool part comes in with how the enemies and other objects interact with that water. Outer Minds really did not have to do this. It's such a small detail that I would have never noticed if it wasn't included, but they truly went the extra mile. If an enemy falls into the ice water for whatever reason, they don't just fall into it and die, they freeze on contact and stay frozen in the water forever. This is such a great detail that makes the whole world you're in feel that much more alive, and it doesn't even stop at enemies either. Coins that fly out of enemies you kill can also touch the water and freeze instantly, which is such an insane level of detail, and whoever thought of that deserved a raise half a decade ago. Like yeah, of course the coins would freeze on impact with the water. Why wouldn't they? It just makes so much sense, and once again, makes everything feel so much more alive than it would have otherwise. It's small details like this that take a game from just average to something to remember for years to come. This level also features another iconic wait and survive segment that so many of these levels have, and this one has a bit of a twist. So there's this segment where you need to wait on a glacier as it drifts to the next place you need to be. But as you're waiting, a group of penguins will be hurling towards you. You have to avoid the penguins while also trying not to slip up and fall into the water. Water. It's a fun little challenge. However, on harder difficulties, some evil, evil person over at Outer Mines thought it was a good idea to put a single spike on the end of this glacier. This one spike makes this section so much harder to do without taking damage and really forces you to get into a significantly more strict movement rhythm than before. So to the one guy in the office who decided to add this singular spike, fuck you, but you're also kind of a genius. Oh yeah, there's also these seals that have mental breakdowns anytime you go near them, and they're pretty annoying. Okay, moving on. Next level. Level. Nothing new is unlocked after glaciers, however we are presented with a choice of two different levels to play here. This is the only time in the game where you're given multiple levels to play at the same time that are both strictly for progression, so it's a pretty cool moment. There are some times later where you unlock multiple levels at once, but only one will be for game progression, while the others will be just some fun side content to chew on. That being said though, this game is short enough as is, and playing both of these levels combined probably only takes a couple minutes, so if you end up playing this game, I recommend just playing both of these levels. So so that's exactly what we're gonna do, starting with level 7, hurry up. Both of these levels are standard platforming levels, however each of them has a unique gimmick that helps them stand apart from each other and also the level we played right before this. This level starts off with another phone call from Marzia, which I didn't even get in my first playthrough because I picked Markiplier here. Whoops! I'm gonna stop talking about these now since they're kind of irrelevant, but remember, there is a payoff for that gag later in the game, so keep it in your mind. You can probably wedge it in there between all the other random plot threads that this game already set up. Anyway, as you may remember from earlier, Hurry Up is that really short level that gives you a fuck ton of coins if you play it on bro mode over and over again. It's not just a short level though, it's easily the shortest in the entire game. But that doesn't make it not fun. This level has you going through a series of fast-paced platforming challenges that build upon some of the ideas seen in glaciers. The main gimmick, however, is the fact that this level is an auto-scroller. That's where the name comes from. You need to keep moving, or else the screen will catch up and push you into the deadly water. Hurry Up features those spike platform things that you need to slide underneath for coins 
coins, except this time, the top paths are not an option, so sliding is the only way to proceed without taking a fat chunk of damage. Hurry Up also introduces these huge balls of ice that fall from the sky, which are essentially just thematically fitting versions of the fireballs seen in previous levels. Their inclusion here was a great choice though, since because everything is moving so fast here, when they start falling from the sky, it's like a massive jump scare. Fuck man, I gotta get moving! It's perfect. The last thing to note here is that because this level is an auto-scroller, getting the patches in this level can be kind of tricky. You really have to go out of your way to be far enough away from the scrolling side of the screen to be able to dig up the patches without falling into the water or getting hit by spikes. Really keeps the pressure on and makes the level just a tad more interesting if you're trying to collect the patches. As neat as it is though, I never want to play it again in my entire life. After playing it for hours to grind money, I am unfortunately sick of it, so we're moving on. Level 8, Windy Scenario, is the longer of these two branching levels, but I ironically have significantly less to say about it. It's pretty much just more of the same level ideas and gimmicks from the previous ice levels, but with one big twist. Throughout the level, the wind will start to kick up and blow either left or right, depending on where you are in the level. What direction the wind blows isn't random either. There are specific platforming challenges in this level that take advantage of the wind going in a certain direction. Here's my take on this. When the wind is pushing you forward and giving you a fuck ton of momentum, this gimmick is really fun. In fact, one of the coolest patches in the game requires you to use this forward wind and an enemy bounce to reach it. There's a point in the level where you're coming up on a bit of a cliff and the wind starts to kick up there. There's a single barrel on the edge of this cliff and on a first playthrough, you probably won't really know what's actually going on here and end up jumping over it. However, you'll soon see what you're actually supposed to do here and probably want to replay the level to give it a try. In order to get the patch, you must enemy bounce off the barrel and use that forward momentum from the the wind and the vertical momentum from the bounce to reach a platform high up that is a single digging pile with a patch hidden inside. Easily one of the coolest patches to find in the entire game. Just ignore the footage of me getting the patch where I cheese the entire thing with Markiplier. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Here's the downside of Windy Scenario though. When the wind is blowing the opposite way, the gimmick becomes a lot less fun and a lot more annoying. I can't think of any section in this level where the wind is blowing you away that was any sort of fun. So yeah, neat level idea, but the execution probably could have been a little better. One last thing though, watching through this footage made me realize I had unlocked Markiplier's unique ability at some point and didn't notice. And since I literally used it to cheese the patch in Windy Scenario I just talked about, I guess there's no better time than now to bring it up. Markiplier's unique ability, the Pink Stash, is actually one of the better ones in the game. All it does is give you a double jump and a glide, but there are surprisingly a lot of sections in Legend of the Brofist that benefit from having those two things. So yeah, this one is really good, and definitely worth playing as Mark to use it. So if you want to pretend this is a Markiplier game instead of a PewDiePie game, you can do that. We've been getting through these levels pretty fast now, and we ain't stopping anytime soon. Next up is level 9, Yeti's Mountain. As the second last level in the North Pole arc, Yeti's Mountain almost serves as one final test for everything introduced during the ice levels in the game. This is another find and survive level, and I think these types of levels really work well when they act as one final challenge for a certain section of the game. After this is the boss fight against General Barrel, then we're moving on to the next arc. So having the penultimate level be a find and survive one featuring pretty much every enemy we've been seeing in the last couple levels is actually really cool. The next arc kind of does this as well, to a significantly lesser degree, but in general I kind of wish the structure of the game followed a pattern where these find and survive levels were all placed near the end of their respective story arcs. This level is the payoff to that small tangent we had about Shannon the Shark earlier, as it features her being tied up and us having to save her. For some reason, every time you untie her, she magically slips away and gets tied up again on the other side of the map. But we don't have time to think about that right now. We need to save Shannon. Untying her is as easy as digging up a pile, as in it's the exact same process. To complete the level, you must untie Shannon a set number of times, which is displayed at the top of the screen. Essentially, think of this is the same structure as the first level, but instead of digging through laundry for your wife, you're untying the same shark over and over again. The amount of times you have to do this changes with the difficulty, but overall this level isn't too bad, especially on lower difficulties. I will say though, the randomization of enemies in these find and survive levels really rears its ugly head here, since this is the first one of these levels where shit can spawn from the sky. A lot of the time it feels really cheap and leaves me feeling like, well if I just got better RNG, I wouldn't have been hit at this exact spot. I don't know, it's just kinda lame. One more thing that I gotta bring up is that the music here slaps. <laughs> What can I say? Rush Jet 1 does not 
miss. Upon successfully saving Shannon for real this time, the level ends and Cinnamon Toast Ken comes to save the day. I think now would be a good time to talk about the voice acting in this game again, because some of the interactions here feel very awkward. What are you doing in a place like this? I'm on a quest to stop those damn barrels. Well, you need to get up here fast. I saw a snow barrel coming this way. If I had to guess, the other voice actors weren't actually given PewDiePie's spoken dialogue to naturally bounce off of, which leads to a lot of the voice acting from the other YouTubers feeling super weird. I'm still glad they did full voice acting, and the awkward delivery is kind of charming looking back at it now, but yeah, it's just really funny. Anyway, PewDiePie can't get up the cliff here to reach General Barrel, but as soon as all hope seems lost, Stefano from inside Pewd's pocket comes to save the day. If you don't remember, which I don't know why you would remember, I never even mentioned this. Stefano was one of the things that PewDiePie picked up in the first level before booking it out of there. Now that we're talking about a new character though, you know what that means, to the wiki. The origin behind Stefano is actually pretty simple, and once again, comes from PewDiePie's time playing Amnesia. Stefano is a small golden statue that originates from a custom story known as Abduction. During the playthrough, PewDiePie picked him off a shelf randomly and decided to name him Stefano. According to his wiki page, he's uh, yeah, he's fucking dead, so that's cool. Anyway, back to the game. Stefano offers to help us up the cliff by tying a rope around him and throwing him up there. There's even a custom talk sprite for this moment, which is really cute. Anyway, Puge throws him up there with the rope, climbs up to the top of the cliff, and makes way for General Barrel. Oh, and they also forgot Stefano in the freezing cold, so I guess we know how he died now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> With all the levels out of the way, we are finally ready to confront and defeat General Barrel. But not before we go over a new unlock first. Stefano might be dead in a frozen wasteland, but his spirit can live on through the next offensive ability, Stefano's Scimitars. This is actually a pretty great ability to have on the attack slot because it kind of acts like a defensive option as well. Upon using the ability, a bunch of scimitars will appear around you. Each scimitar can take one hit from an enemy before disappearing. So not only does it kill the enemies, it can also just flat out protect you from them. I would absolutely say this is a pretty high tier option, the only real downsides being that it can make enemy bouncing either impossible at the start or kind of hard once you've lost a few. And they also disappear like the shield from earlier if not used up within a set amount of time, which is pretty lame. Overall though, very solid. Alright, now that we know what that ability does, we can shimmy on over to the final level of this arc and our second ever boss fight. Level 10, General Barrel. First things first, I know this is like next level nitpicking, but Ken has this line where he says that his bear hat can smell shit and that's gonna help us, but if you equip some of the costumes I'm gonna talk about later, this line makes no fucking sense because he doesn't have the hat anymore. <laughs> Jeez, Outer Minds, why couldn't you have predicted the future when writing the script for this game? Anyway, yes, this fight features Ken digging up parts of the snow to try and find General Barrel, so you can jump on him and deal damage. Oh, also General Barrel is a snowman now, uh, don't question it. This fight is really cool, and utilizes a lot of the weight and survive elements in the game design we've been talking about up until this point. Near the start of the fight, Ken will dig up General Barrel very quickly, but as the fight goes on, you have to survive against waves of enemies to try to get another hit on him. The coolest thing about this fight is that the order in which Ken digs up both General Barrel and the enemies is not random from attempt to attempt, so you can actually learn from your attempts and have a better understanding of what you're getting into next time. If these things were randomized here, I don't think this boss would be nearly as fun, but learning the phases and patterns just adds a whole other layer of strategy that wouldn't be there otherwise. The way things build up is stressful as hell though. During that last hit, you have to deal with waves of toxic barrels while ice balls fall from the top of the cave all at once. It's just an endless barrage of attacks coming your way, but you'll be way more prepared for it knowing that it will be pretty much the exact same every attempt. The gradual increase in difficulty this boss has is really cool, and more importantly, pretty fair in my opinion. No hitting that last section does seem like a fucking nightmare though, being real. In between hits you do on the general, he will start to bury himself under the snow and proceed to try to catch you off guard with a sharp icicle. He just follows where you are, however, so as long as you keep moving, this attack is fairly easy to dodge. Once you land the final blow to General Barrel, his snowman disguise is immediately destroyed, and almost in an instant that little bitch is already on the phone crying to King Barrel. King Barrel, now fed up with his own minions, decides that the only course of action is to hire someone only referred to as him. This kicks off the next arc, which I'm going to call the Secret Boss Arc. This is easily the longest one in the game with the most level variety, and it all leads into figuring out who this person is that King Barrel hired. Also, in this phone call, King Barrel refers to PewDiePie as a vlogger for some reason, which is maybe like half true, but bro is a gamer first and foremost. Get it right, King Barrel, come on! Anyway, General Barrel fucking explodes after being hung up on. 
Cool. Oh yeah, I also have something here at the end of my notes for this boss fight saying, the line delivery at the end of this is genuinely painful, lol. So I'll just let this conversation between Pewds and Ken play out, and you can be the judge of that one. You should go through here. There were barrels going in and out of this cave. I've heard them talking about a prisoner they've captured. Then there's no time to lose. See ya. I'll make sure no one follows you from here. Thank you. God. I love this game. Right after beating that boss fight, a couple new things unlock. For starters, Ken is now a playable character, despite literally saying two seconds ago that he was going to stay behind and watch out for PewDiePie. Okay, cool, Ken. His ability allows him to turn into a rainbow bear for a bit and be invincible. This one's pretty okay. Once again, I don't really like any of these invincibility power-ups, but at least the bear has cute sprite work. The other thing we unlock here is time warp. All this does is slow down time for a little bit, which is kind of useful, but at the same time, just get good. You should not be wasting your defense slot on this shit. It's situational at best, while competing against multiple other power-ups that are useful on every level. Okay then, guess we should jump straight into the first level of the secret boss arc. This is level 11, Mine's Entrance. The first thing I have to bring up here in regards to this level is the music. Holy shit, this track is so good. Yeah, it's a banger. That was the first note I had written down for this level, and it was for a damn good reason. Anyway, on to the actual level, which is another standard platforming romp. This level does mark a bit of a difficulty spike for the game, though. More deadly barrel types are significantly more common than before, such as these TNT barrels that explode if you get too close to them. There's also these skeletons that throw bones in an arc formation that are annoying as hell to deal with half the time, since it's so hard to approach them thanks to the bone mixed with their movement patterns. Another new enemy in this level are the bats, which can be annoying as hell at times, but also serve as a great example of the game's bouncing mechanics. Since the black bats specifically follow your character around, if there are multiple black bats coming at you, you can start bouncing on them for height, and they will continue to follow you up and serve as bounce platforms. It's a neat mechanic, and it isn't really explored that much here, but a level later on requires you to do this for a patch, so the devs definitely designed them like this on purpose. In the middle of the level, there's an epic gamer Zelda reference, which gives you a free heart. This wouldn't be that noteworthy, but on higher difficulties, this heart is actually complete bait, and will instantly kill you on contact, which is pretty funny. Mine's entrance also introduces these moving platforms that we'll see more creative use of later in these cave levels. The patches and other dig piles in this level are really put in clever places that you would likely have to actively go out of your way to get, such as down near insta-kill spikes when the level design is telling you to stay above them on those moving platforms I just mentioned. Overall, a pretty decent level and a good start to this arc. Although I will say, this level was a lot longer in my head than it actually ended up being. Definitely one of the shorter levels. This is fine, however, since the next level is essentially just an extension of Mind's Entrance that builds upon the ideas presented here. So why waste any time? Let's get right into level 12, Deep in the Mines. This level kicks off with a cutscene showing a certain Irish YouTuber tied up and being guarded by two different barrels that are definitely dating, by the way. They are very gay. And I'm happy for them, damn it. Then, without any control of our character, we are forced to murder the happy couple in cold blood to save Jacksepticeye. Zero out of ten, worst level in the game. Fight me. The difference between Jack and Pewd's voice performance in this level back to back genuinely made me laugh out loud. You can tell at this point in the recording process that PewDiePie just did not give a shit, then you have Jack putting all his energy into it. Maybe a little too much energy though, because I swear that Jack's mic is peaking in some of these lines, and it just makes the whole performance way funnier by accident. Yeah! Thanks for the rescue! Now let me help you! Why I and I will guide you through this place. Awesome. Awesome! <laughs> So, Jack tags along with you throughout this entire level, and uses his companion to destroy rocks blocking the path at certain points in this level. Although if you play as Jack here, then his actual companion does the work, which is a nice bit of detail. Although if you lose the companion in this scenario, the companion still appears to destroy the rocks even though they are literally dead. Someone get MadPat on this, please! The structure of this level is pretty much identical to the last one, with the same enemy types and mechanics. But everything is much more flushed out here. The biggest example of that is the moving platforms that were seen in the previous level. Now, there are entire wait and survive segments dedicated to them and they take up much more of the runtime. 
Now, instead of just using the platforms to get across large patches of spikes, you have to wait on them to make progression in the level while dodging a bunch of shit and using them to climb up a segment with spikes on the walls. I find it really rewarding as a player when games take mechanics introduced in previous levels and use them in harder ways. So this is probably my favorite aspect of this level particularly. It really makes you feel like you're learning stuff and that the game respects and understands that. At the end of the level, we're faced with the biggest roadblock yet. Jennifer. I'll keep this explanation brief, because like most character references in this game, Jennifer comes from Amnesia Custom Stories. Pretty much, Jennifer is a rock or a stone that changes size depending on the custom story, but she's often used to block the way forward in certain areas. Which hey, that's what she's doing in this game, so that's neat. PewDiePie calls her fat a lot, and that's pretty much the gist of it. Thank you, PewDiePie fan wiki. I don't know what I'd do without you. Anyway, Jennifer fucking dies and Jack decides to stay back instead of coming with PewDiePie, ending off the level on a bit of a sad note. Remember like one minute ago when I said someone needs to get MatPat on this? Well screw that, because now I'm MatPat, and I'm gonna do my own mini-game theory. Side note, the day I wrote this section of the script was the day that MatPat announced he was retiring. Feels bad, man. Anyway, here we go. GAME THEORY! Everyone in this game fucking hates PewDiePie. Think about it for a second. Obviously all the barrels and enemies hate PewDiePie, but we need to go deeper than just that. Markiplier kicks PewDiePie off his huge private jet and makes him fend for himself in the sky. Marzia is relieved when PewDiePie leaves the house to start his quest. Ken and Jack both lie to him, saying they're going to stay behind, when in reality, both of them end up becoming playable characters. This doesn't even stop there. What about the little side characters, like Stefano? Stefano was left in the middle of the Arctic for no reason, and PewDiePie watched Jennifer die in front of him and did nothing about it. The only unlockable YouTuber left that I keep forgetting the name of for some reason, huh, that's weird, will probably also hate PewDiePie by the end of his section as well, so we'll pick up on this theory again whenever it's relevant. I think it's pretty solid though, not to pat myself on the back or anything. Anyway, yes, as mentioned in my little theory segment there, Jack is now an unlockable character. And with that comes another unique ability. Jack's ability allows him to turn into a giant invincible eyeball and shoot lasers, which is kind of cool, but this ability would be about 40 million times better if it just let you fly around. As it stands, it's kind of just a less visually interesting version of every other invincibility ability in the game. I do kind of wish there was more variety in these unique abilities, but it's not a huge deal. In fact, the next unlockable character, who I'm still drawing a blank on for some reason, actually does have a pretty unique ability, so at least that's something. Now that we are officially out of the caves, we can make our way over to the next set of levels in this arc, the forest levels. This starts off with level 13, Treetops. A new level theme means new music to listen to, and I'm happy to report this is another certified banger. This track gives off a sense of adventure, while also dabbling a little bit into the unknown as well. It's a spooky forest after all. You never know what you might find the deeper you go inside of it. Another amazing track. It should just be expected at this point, to be fair. Even though this is a different level theme from the caves one, the transition between these two feels extremely natural. A lot of the enemy types from the caves carry over to the forest, such as the bats and the skeletons, and they blend in almost seamlessly with the new enemies. The forest really just feels like a natural difficulty spike from the caves, introducing a similar level theme that features some trickier platforming and tons of bottomless pits, something that the cave levels lacked entirely. This level style also opens the door for more vertical platforming challenges, something that once again was very rare to see in the cave levels. Pretty much what I'm trying to say here is that these two level themes kind of just feel like one big level theme of spooky areas and they blend together very well in terms of difficulty and atmosphere. Very cool shit. Outer Minds was cooking. However, as cool as this level is, I find a lot of the new enemy types introduced here kind of fucking annoying. Especially the bees. Fuck the bees. They follow you around if you get too close to their hive, and don't even damage you upon reaching your character. They just slow you down to a halt, and nerf your jump to oblivion until they decide to just fuck off. This is even more annoying on a level like this, where you need to be making jumps constantly in order not to fall down the countless bottomless pits. These siren enemies that shoot energy balls at you are also annoying as hell. They stick around around way too long, and unless you hit them almost immediately, are damn near impossible to kill. I think Legend of the Brofist is truly at its worst when the enemy spam is like this, especially on harder difficulties. It makes the fun platforming feel way more overwhelming than it should be. Even on that note though, I don't hate this level. I mean, I spent the whole first chunk praising its theme and level structure, so it's not all bad. In fact, there's a new enemy added here that I actually do like, that being the werewolves. Their whole gimmick is that they jump really high and chase you down until you decide 
decide to kill them. The main reason I like them, specifically in this level at least, is that there's a really cool patch you can get by enemy bouncing on them to get higher up the trees. That part of this level stood out to me a lot, and I think it's a really sick way to use the jump height of these enemies for a fun little challenge. One last thing I gotta mention about the treetops is the new environmental hazard introduced here. Poison gas. When designing platforming levels with a lot of vertical movement, there are some fun twists you can throw in there that would never work nearly as well in a more standard horizontal level, and the poison gas is one of those fun twists. It rises from the bottom of the screen and forces you to platform up the trees in order to get to safety, and I just think that's a really clever way to make the player use all the resources they have at their disposal in order to stay alive. In this case, those resources are higher platforms on the trees, but you get what I mean. That's pretty much it for this level. Another neat one with some questionable enemy types. It's been a minute since our last find and survive level, so let's change that with the next level on the list, level 16, Transylvania. You see, that's what I would say if the world map wasn't about to have a fucking stroke. At this point in the game, we are presented with three, count them, three different levels to go to. Transylvania is the only level out of any of these that actually matters for progression, but on the level list, there are two completely optional levels that technically come before it. That being Nostalgia Clouds and Nostalgia Spikes. The sequel levels to Nostalgia Skies I briefly mentioned earlier. These are levels 14 and 15 respectively, so in order to truly break down this game in level order, these levels are our next stop on the list. If you're wondering what the third level that unlocked is, that's the Halloween DLC level that was added in a later update. During my playthrough, I did play it around this point in the game, however for the sake of going in level order, we'll talk about all the DLC levels after we go over the final boss. So if you think I'm skipping levels for some reason, trust me, I'm not. We'll get to all that stuff later. Since this is a bit of a detour in the overall scheme of this video, however, I'm going to be talking about both these nostalgia levels together in one section to save a bit of time. So let's get to it. These are levels 14 and 15, Nostalgia Clouds and Nostalgia Spikes. I'm going to be so real with you right now. These two levels are some of the best pure platforming this game has to offer, but their placement on the world map genuinely makes me so mad. These levels should not be optional in a game that's already this short, and they should not be thrown right next to each other either. Both of these levels would work perfectly as transition levels at certain points in the game, yet for some reason they're just thrown away here where a good majority of the players may not even give them a try. It's pretty obvious just from their placement on the map that completing these levels won't be bringing the player closer to the end of the game. So yeah, there's a really high chance they were skipped over. In fact, I have a bit of a theory that at some point in development, these levels were supposed to be used as transition levels between certain arcs or sections of the game. For example, Nostalgia Clouds features multiple elements seen in the cave levels, and Nostalgia Spikes has certain elements that we'll see once again near the end of the game. Why would these be put right here on the world map of all places then? Wouldn't it make more sense if these levels that share certain aspects with other levels in the game were placed, oh, I don't know, next to those levels? Here's the real kicker, however. If you were to take a look at the official YouTube uploads of the soundtrack, you might notice that Nostalgia Clouds and Nostalgia Spikes are not where they should be given their placement on the world map. The soundtrack is ordered by level number, so why aren't they even close to each other on the list? I'll tell you why. The soundtrack 100% shows us where these levels were originally supposed to take place in the game. Nostalgia Clouds is placed right after General Barrel, making it a perfect transition to the cave levels, and Nostalgia Spikes is placed right before the final batch of levels levels in the game, exactly where you think it would be. So yeah, it's all but confirmed that these levels were originally supposed to be mandatory and served as in-between challenges at the start of the final two arcs in the game. I swear man, going into this I did not think I'd have this much of an issue with the world map of all things, but time and time again it keeps biting me right in the ass. Now that we have that nonsense out of the way, let's talk about something significantly more positive, the music. Remember when I told you to keep a certain detail about Nostalgia Skies in the back of your head for whenever we got around to talking about these levels? That's because all three of the Nostalgia levels share the exact same song, but each level in the trilogy changes the song in different ways. It's such a fucking awesome detail that they did not have to do, but they did it anyway. For a quick reminder, here's what Nostalgia Skies sounds like. <laughs> Pretty great song, right? Now that we're refreshed on that, here's what both the Nostalgia Clouds and Nostalgia Spikes versions of the same song sound like. one of my 
my favorite details in the entire game, and another reason as to why I'm upset they clumped these two levels together the way they did. This gimmick would hit so much harder if these levels almost served as rest points between arcs, and the subtle music changes would hit all the harder because of it, especially Nostalgia Spikes. The changes to the song on there really make it sound like you're about to come up to the end of a long adventure, which is completely lost in the release version of the game's level order. Okay, enough bitching about that, how about we talk about the levels themselves? Nostalgia Clouds is all around a really solid platforming level. Not as good as Nostalgia Spikes, but there's still a lot of cool segments in it. There's this one part where in order to reach a patch, you to jump on top of an exploding cow very quickly, which I find really interesting, since up until this point, you have in no way ever been encouraged to even get close to those things. I just think it's cool. However, the end of this level kind of just devolves into a mess of random cloud platforms and a million bats, and not only is it kind of lazy, it's just really annoying to get around. Nostalgia Spikes, on the other hand, is a fantastic level in my opinion. I love all the tight platforming that the spike balls make you do, and there's some great wait and survive segments thrown in for good measure. Near the end, there's this patch you can get but it's located in the middle of an area where a spike ball is constantly going back and forth. To get it, you have to take breaks from digging to jump and avoid the spike ball, and I just think that's a really fun use of the game's mechanics. So yeah, overall these are both solid as hell levels that get screwed over by their placement on the world map. With that out of the way, we can finally get back on track with the story and actually talk about the next find and survive level. For real this time, this is Level 16, Transylvania. If we ignore how brilliant that first level is at teaching the player the game mechanics specifically, this is probably the best find and survive level in the entire game. It takes all the best aspects of this level type and applies them to an area that's just big enough to make them all work. Like that annoying thing from Yeti's Mountain, where enemies falling from the sky felt unfair as hell? Not a problem here. The layout of the area is so large and tall that stuff falling from the top is almost never an issue until it's actually on the ground. I still think the randomized enemies in these levels are a little annoying, but if you're going to do that, this is the way to do it. Transylvania features another appearance from Markiplier, who says he'll try to get PewDiePie out of the forest with his helicopter. So there's no finding here, just surviving until Markiplier arrives and takes us to Africa, the location of the secret boss. Now, here's something kind of interesting. You might be wondering what would happen if you were to play this level as Markiplier, since we do have him unlocked at this point in the game. Well, Outer Minds actually did account for this, and if you play a level level that features a certain character as that character, they will be replaced with a duck. Genuinely a really funny workaround, and all the dialogue works still, since the YouTuber voice acting is just swapped with a bunch of stock duck sounds. <coughs> Thought I'd mention that in case someone out there was curious. Although if you're this deep in this fucking video, you probably want to know every little detail anyway. Two of the patches in this level require doing some gnarly enemy jumps to reach both the left and right side of a cliff, that are too high up to jump to normally. Because the enemy spawns are random, you really have to pay attention to your opportunity to get these when some bats or other enemies spawn high up on the trees. Another cool gimmick of this level is an expanded upon version of the shadow demons from Abandoned Subway, and the poison gas from treetops. The poison gas returns, but with a new trick. Now it can come from either the top or the bottom of the screen, which forces you to make your way either up or down in order to be safe. This is just the vertical version of the Shadow Demons gimmick, but I would be lying if I said it wasn't a really cool level mechanic. This level sort of acts as a big finale for the current arc of the game. It just doesn't hit as hard as the last time they did this, considering there's still one more level after this before the arc is actually concluded with a boss fight. Once the helicopter arrives, you have to make it over there without dying in order to get the hell out of the forest and end the level. However, if you jump into the helicopter from the top instead of the sides or the bottom, you are killed immediately because of the blades of the helicopter, which I'm not even gonna lie, is funny as fuck. Um, are we supposed to get into that? I'm just gonna- Are you- kidding me are you kidding me is this oh my god is this game for real the helicopter blades can kill you the helicopter blades the helicopter blade it's Oh. Little Timmy playing this game in 2015 definitely rage quit over that one. But yes, with Transylvania out of the way, we can finally talk about the last part of this arc, the Africa levels. Thematically, these two levels are completely different from the rest of the arc, which is a little jarring, but the game has done weirder shit at this point. You're just gonna have to accept it. Without further delay, let's talk about the next level on the list. Level 17, Savannah Chase. If you thought my theory about everyone hating PewDiePie was debunked by Mark helping him out in the previous level, this level starts off with Markiplier kicking PewDiePie off a moving helicopter to his death in the middle of Africa. PewDiePie ends up surviving the drop because the game, quote unquote, 
doesn't have fall damage, but we don't know if Markiplier knew that. Been about, what, 10 minutes since we last brought up music, huh? How about we do that again? Because Savannah Chase is a bop. The drums on this track specifically are awesome, and totally fit the vibe the level is going for. Speaking of the actual level, Savannah Chase is pretty much a sequel level to Highway Frenzy from all the way back at the start of the game. Just replace the cars with rhinos and crank the difficulty from like a 2 to like a 7. The main difference between these two levels is that in Savannah Chase, there are a series of spike ball patterns coming your way at most points in the level that you have to react to fast in order to dodge. Some you have to duck to survive, some require a jump, and some require some very precise jumps. This isn't Battletoads level bullshit, however. You're given a warning via these little signals on the right side of the screen. These alert you to which pattern of spikes is coming up next, and make this level much more bearable than it would be if they were not included. There are points where you have to start dodging a bunch of these patterns in quick succession, and while I'm pretty bad at it personally, it's oh so satisfying to string together a successful set of movements and dodge everything without a lick of damage. This level has a really major feeling of, I've almost got it. You're constantly shown goals, such as the golden flag or the checkpoint, and you have to survive just a little bit longer in your current Rhino in order to get there. This, once again, brings back one of Legend of the Brofist's core design philosophies of wait and survive, and I think it's done exceptionally well here with both the inclusion of the spike balls and the returning enemies the player is already familiar with, such as the massive fireballs that come from the sky. All around, this level is just a fun time and gets you right into the mood they're trying to set up for this small section of the game. But with Savannah Chase done, there's only one more level left of this arc. It's time we meet the secret boss himself. This is level 18, The Headhunter. Here we are at the second last boss fight of the entire game. There has been a lot of build up to this moment. We went from some caves, to a scary forest, back to some random ass cloud levels for some reason not even god knows, back to the forest, and finally dropped right into Africa to face the secret boss once and for all. Who did King Barrel hire to take out PewDiePie once and for all? His name is Falcon Lover. Yep, a fucking giraffe with a gun and cool ass shades. And he's one of the coolest motherfuckers in this entire game. As you could probably guess, this is another PewDiePie channel lore character. So allow me to swing on over to the fan wiki to give you a brief explanation on who this secret boss truly is. Falcon Lover was kind of this bit created by PewDiePie to mock YouTube commenters who would either spam or self-promote themselves on all of his videos. The actual YouTube channel featured in the bit isn't a real commenter or anything, it was just Pews on an alt account taking screenshots for the video. Falcon Lover had a giraffe profile picture and a very peculiar way of typing, both of which are represented in his appearance in Legend of the Brofist. I'm gonna be straight up here and say I am genuinely so dog shit at this boss fight. For some reason I can never nail down Falcon Lover's movement patterns and just eat shit every single time, so sorry if the gameplay here is atrocious. I'll try my best to break down and review this fight regardless though. Falcon Lover's main attack is moving back and forth on the small platform the fight takes place on. There are three different rocks that he will either bounce on top of or go underneath, and it's not always clear which path he's going to take, which is the main reason I'm garbage at this fight. Once he gets tired of spinning around, he'll stop in place and give you an opportunity to hit him on the head. Repeat this a couple times and the fight is over. The last mechanic of this boss is the gun, which isn't just for show. Falcon Lover tries his best to no-scope you while he's spinning around, which is represented by multiple reticles appearing on screen that move around along with him. If you get caught in one of these reticles when Falcon Lover decides to shoot, you automatically take insta-kill damage and lose one of your companion lives. It's easy enough to dodge these gunshots, but boy does it sting when you get caught up in one of them. That's pretty much the whole boss fight. And while I love that Falcon Lover is in this, this fight almost seems a little underwhelming compared to the previous bosses. It just has less shit going on, which makes it feel a lot smaller in scale. There's so much build up to this fight specifically compared to every other normal boss, and overall, it's just kind of average. I wish the game had another level or two in the Africa section, and this boss was reworked to be a little more grand with extra phases and shit. But given how fast this game was thrown together, I can't complain that much. The fight ends with Falcon Lover showing PewDiePie how to get to the barrel base, which is just by using an app on his phone, and the secret boss arc comes to a close. That was truly a set of some of the most creative levels in the entire game, but now we turn towards the next opponent, King Barrel himself. The King Barrel arc spans five levels and features some of the toughest challenges yet, and it all leads into the final battle with the king. 
Before we get into that next level and kick off the arc though, Falcon Lover left us a present in the form of the next unlockable attack ability, Pro 360 No Scope. This one is actually very useful. It's essentially just a screen wipe attack. You use it and it shoots down any enemies in the area, which can be super helpful when shit's getting chaotic. Overall, a solid ability that I found myself using quite a few times while playing the game. So with that out of the way, we're ready to kick off this arc in style with level 19, UFO Computer. Let's do this thing. This is easily one of the biggest platforming levels in the entire game. Not big as in long, although it is kind of long. I mean big as in just the scope of everything. UFO Computer has so many crazy branching paths and secret areas off to the side, and I still feel like I've probably missed at least one area in this level to this day, just because of how much is on display here. The level theming is awesome as well. I really like the whole Tron-esque vibe this location gives off. This is also, unsurprisingly, another level with phenomenal music. Because of the sheer amount of exploration this level offers, in order to get all of the patches, you have to go out of your way to check out certain sections of the level that won't progress you further, but will reward you in other ways for taking on some small platforming challenges. This whole level just utilizes the space it's set in really well, and is definitely one of the coolest ones in the entire game. The main gimmick that UFO Computer introduces is these platforms that disappear and reappear on a set timing. I actually really like these sections, and I think they're quite satisfying to go through. It makes you feel big brained. There's also these little alien enemies, which are kind of annoying, but they're very cute, so they get the pass. Man, what a sick level. I sure do hope nothing ruins it and also ruins the chances of this game ever being ported to another system for the rest of eternity. Oh, god damn it! Yes, it's finally time to address the elephant that's been in the room with us for the better part of this entire video. The reason the thumbnail says banned in it, and the reason this game is forever for fucked. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, I give a cold welcome to our final playable character in the story mode, Cryotic. I can't breathe when you're not there. Who I have just magically remembered the name of after pretending, I mean forgetting about it, this whole video. I'm not going to go into everything too much here, because frankly, that's not what this video is about. If you really want to know the longer version of this story that I'm going to quickly explain, YouTuber June the King has a great video that goes over everything. I highly recommend watching it if you're interested in learning more. But here's the quick TLDR of why Cry is a controversial figure. He groomed minors. Yep. <laughs> Once again, not gonna go into it all here, but it's impossible to talk about this game without bringing this up, considering this guy is one of the playable characters. So, we have this fantastic game with great levels, a great soundtrack, fun gameplay, but it will forever be bogged down by the inclusion of this fucking loser. It makes me so mad, because this game would be awesome on Switch or any other consoles, but there's a fat chance that will ever happen, unless Outer Minds updates this nearly 10 year old game. So yeah, it sucks. I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Once again, you can watch June's video for way more information, including how Cry and PewDiePie even became friends in the first place. But yeah, this shit's just depressing, man. Anyway, Cry tags along with PewDiePie for the remainder of the level as they escape the UFO computer and teleport to the moon. This then leads into one of the most iconic moments in this entire game that has aged fucking terribly now that I'm thinking about it. Whoa, this is beautiful. I'm so glad we got to share this moment. Boots. Oh, cry. Do you think there's something between us? Shh. Let's not ruin this moment with words. Everywhere. This is also where that joke with Marcia constantly calling PewDiePie finally reaches its punchline, as she calls just before Cry and PewDiePie have a makeout sesh. Cry leaves, and after all this time, we have finally made it to the barrel base on the moon. Also, for the game theory from earlier, you can assume that Cry probably hates PewDiePie now because of this scene. Add it to the pile. There's a quick cutscene that shows that the next couple levels are going to have moon physics, and with that, our time in the UFO computer is done. Other than the Cry stuff, this level is really cool, and I enjoyed playing through this one quite a bit. 
It serves as a great transition into the next couple stages and really hypes you up to finish the game. Back on the world map, Cry is unlocked as a playable character. If you remember from earlier, I did mention that this character actually had a unique ability that wasn't just some form of invincibility, and that comes in the form of the Mask of Cuteness. Using this ability turns all the enemies in the area into small red versions of Cry's companions. These little things don't do damage and will give you a guaranteed gold coin upon defeating them. If there weren't other better money grinding tactics in this game, this one would probably be way better than it actually is. At least it's original though. Another ability is unlocked here, Power Duck. Power Duck turns you into an invincible duck for a short period of time, but also gives you the ability to do a small double jump and stall your falling by flapping your wings. This one would be way cooler if it wasn't undermined by something we're going to talk about later. Enough of all that though, we only have four more levels until the end of the game. It's time to talk about level 20, On the Moon. As stated previously, this last set of levels all feature low gravity. I think it's a really neat and thematically fitting addition to end the game on, and opens the door for some crazy level design. Like, if you thought normal enemy bounces were cool, just wait until you see moon enemy bounces. You get sent flying into the air, and it's a lot of fun. This level in particular is a great introduction to the level gimmicks we'll be seeing for the next little bit, as it's not too hard, but also not too easy just the perfect balance of challenge and teaching the player so they're more well prepared for the moon levels ahead, which can get kind of crazy as we'll see in just a bit. At this point, you probably already saw this coming, but we have to talk about the music for these moon levels, because holy shit, it is so cool. If you remember from all the way back at the start of the video, I talked about the title screen for Legend of the Brofist. That title screen has great music, and well, this track is actually a remix of that very song, which is only fitting considering this is truly the finale of the entire game. Gotta bring back those feels, man. Take a listen to the track. It's awesome. genuinely get goosebumps every time I hear that track in game, man. It is so good. The moon levels feature a wide variety of enemies from the entire game up until this point, from barrels to aliens. It truly makes the experience feel like one final race to the finish to finally end this once and for all. I do wish the moon had maybe a few enemies to call its own, but there are enough new ideas introduced here that it all works out in the end regardless. Speaking of new ideas, alongside the low gravity platforming, there are also segments of the levels where you enter areas that have the game's normal gravity and controls. Very smart to see on the part of Outer Minds, because not only do we get to have fun with the new controls, but this opens the door for some more standard, tight platforming segments that challenge the player in more traditional ways. Overall, the moon is just a really sick level theme, with some great ideas that are explored even further in the levels to come. And since I'm pretty much done talking about this level, let us go further and talk about level 21, Barrel Base. As the title of the level implies, Barrel Base takes us deeper into the moon and begins our attack on the home base of the barrels themselves. Because of this, this level incorporates a lot more normal gravity segments than the previous level did. There are these underground areas inside the moon that you can enter and do quick normal platforming challenges in. And I thought these were a really clever way to naturally show the barrels taking over the environment of the moon itself by building smaller bases and such underneath the moon. Near the end of the level, you find yourself at a bigger portion of the base with this huge metal structure that you need to platform around in in order to finish the level. It's pretty sick. Overall, I actually don't have a lot to say about this level because even if it's cool, it's pretty much just an extended version of the previous level in terms of presentation and mechanics on display. However, the final level before we take on King Barrel is not like this, and is actually one of the best levels in the entire game. So let's get to that, huh? This is level 22, deep in the base. Similar to UFO Computer, this level is huge. There are so many secret areas and paths that lead to all sorts of rewards, patches, and coins. I always love when the levels in this game use the space they're given to the maximum degree, and this level absolutely does that without question. When it comes to just pure platforming and gameplay, this is without a doubt one of, if not the best level in the entire game. As much fun as the low gravity stuff is, it would kind of take away from this level if it was incorporated in it more. Like, this is the final test before taking on King Barrel himself. It would be weird if it wasn't just a no bullshit tough platforming challenge. Thankfully though, that is exactly what it is. Because of this, the low gravity segments are kept to an absolute minimum here, pretty much just being one small section in the whole level. The actual location of this level, as the name says, is deep in the barrel base. So the areas you go through are not just the same moon locations from before. Now you're inside the base itself for real and have to fend your way through the waves of barrels in order to make it to the end. The main gist of this level is really just to test you on every general platforming mechanic the game has thrown at you thus far. There's really not anything super notable to dissect because of that. Like I've already talked 
talked about all this shit in length already. However, I would like to highlight the various new mechanics and ideas this level brings to the table. First up are these ball things that you can bounce on. These actually do show up in a level before this, being nostalgia spikes, but they are barely used there and might as well belong to this level. The balls have the same bounce properties as pretty much every enemy in the game, so they're used in platforming challenges here to test your skills on enemy bounces. There's a segment where you need to cross a large pit of spikes, and the only way to do so is to bounce on the balls that are just above the spikes. It's a really fun section that genuinely does put your game knowledge to the test in a fun way. Because these balls have the same bounce properties as enemies, it makes the challenge feel way more natural to the player than it probably would have otherwise. The other new addition here are these arrow panels that appear on a couple walls in the level. These raise you up in the air if you go in front of them, which is used in a few cool parts of the level. Don't have much to say about them specifically, but they are very neat. Overall though, Deep in the Base is just a strong ass final level before the final boss, and really hyped me up while playing the game. My one major issue with this segment of the game is that the moon doesn't have a find and survive level to call its own, which is really unfortunate. Do I think something like this should have replaced this level? Hell no. But just putting one before this level or something would have gone a long way to make this ending part of the game feel a bit more complete. Like, a survival level in moon physics? Tell me that does not sound like fun. It's also weird because every other arc in the game at least has one find and survive level, so to just not represent one of the main level types from the entire game in the last arc is a little odd. Regardless of that though, we have one final level to talk about. One final challenge. Well, ignoring the post-game stuff at least, trust me, we aren't done here just yet. Hold your horses. But yes, I think it's finally time we confront the man himself, King Barrel. This is level 23, Final Showdown. I say this with zero hint of irony, and at this point in the video, you probably just expect that from me. But this might be one of the greatest 2D platformer final bosses ever crafted. It expertly takes the two core gameplay styles that we've been talking about for so long at this point, and somehow converts them almost effortlessly into a solid boss battle. But before we can actually talk about the fight, we need to start from the beginning. The fight starts with you on an elevator on your way up to King Barrel. With the time you're given alone, it really lets you reflect on the journey you've had up until this point all the challenges and bosses you've overcome. I cannot believe I'm writing this about a fucking PewDiePie game, but this shit is beautiful, damn it! Once the elevator finally arrives at the top of the barrel base, you walk onto an empty battlefield, with all your fans, your bros, trapped behind the glass. At first, it doesn't seem like many are here, though. Didn't King Barrel steal them all? Soon, countless barrels start to walk in from both sides of the screen, and you know there's only one thing to do. Bounce. So you kill some barrels until one of them randomly drops a green thing after being defeated. Walking over to said green thing reveals that it's actually a bounce pad, and you're sent flying into the air. And at that point, you see him. For the first time, face to face. King Barrel. When he drops down and releases a mighty roar, you finally see where the rest of the bros are. Inside him. King Barrel has truly taken all of the bros, and all that's left in his puzzle is to defeat and contain you. And after a short exchange between the two fighters, the final battle truly begins. Barrels start coming from the sides again, and from that point, you already know what to do. The game already taught you what to do. You kill those barrels, find that bounce pad, and jump on King Barrel. Also, hey look, Jennifer is somehow not dead and ended up in space, where she will live forever because she's a fucking rock. <laughs> Jennifer's sad fate aside though, I mentioned in the intro of the segment that this boss was able to combine both core gameplay styles from the main levels into this one boss fight. At this point, you probably don't need me to repeat what those two level styles are, but just in case you somehow forgot, I'm of course referring to find and survive and standard platforming. Phase 1 of the fight deals with the find and survive stuff, and Phase 2 deals with the platforming stuff. Phase 1 kicks off with the barrels coming at you from both sides, like I said before. And this is where the core find and survive elements come into play. In order to actually get a hit on King Barrel, you must find the green bounce pad. And in order to do that, you must survive both waves of barrels coming at you from both sides, and King Barrel's attacks. Once you find the bounce pad, you have to go high into the air and land on King Barrel's head. Do this three more times, and the first phase of the fight is over. In between each hit, there will be another survival segment that you have to do in order to get to the next part of the fight. These are a series of lasers that you need to wait for and dodge, some fire raining from the sky that has to be avoided, and another laser one that is completely different which makes you move up these newly spawned platforms in order to dodge both these circle robot things and a massive laser. 
Each time you're given another opportunity to find the green bounce pad, the amount of barrels you have to destroy in order to find it will increase, making surviving the whole thing even harder. King Barrel also gains new powers as this phase goes on, such as a shockwave every time he lands on the ground that deals damage, and a higher moon jump for more unpredictable traversal. Even if this fight was just this phase, I would still call it a peak boss battle. And for the longest time, I actually did think this was the only phase. If you play the game on the default, easy difficulty, the second phase just doesn't happen. Yet another reason why hard mode is the best way to experience this game on your first playthrough. You flat out miss on a really sick second phase otherwise. We'll get into said sick second phase in a second, but you already know I need to take a quick break to talk about the music. <laughs> I never brought up the standard boss theme because it's really not that noteworthy, but the King Barrel boss music on the other hand is a whole other story. This shit is tough as hell. Truly a certified banger. But what about that second phase? After hitting King Barrel on the head enough times, he becomes tired and decides to rest on the other side of the arena. In this phase, you need to hit him on the head another three times, but this go around, you won't be getting help from the green bounce pad. You need to do it using your own game knowledge. This is where the platforming elements come in. In order to hit King Barrel on the head and do damage, you must enemy bounce your way over to his head using the barrels that he's now spewing out of himself. You can't mess up either, because fire has now fallen from the sky again and will instantly damage you if you mess up while doing the enemy jumps. Taking one of the core concepts of the entire game and making you do it all one last time in the most intense use of the mechanic yet is such a fucking awesome way to end this game, and I love this fight even more because of it. After doing this three separate times, where each time the barrels become harder to enemy bounce on, you finally land the last hit on King Barrel and end the fight for good. The legendary Brofist is used against King Barrel, and he's blown up into many pieces. With all the bros finally saved, and King Barrel defeated for good, the entire playable cast of the game comes out and does their iconic end screen dances. And with that, PewDiePie, Legend of the Brofist, comes to a close. Holy fuck. This game and these characters have pretty much become my entire life for the better part of a month, so to finally be able to write those words into the script is a feeling like no other and saying them is equally as crazy. I love this game, I love this soundtrack, and I loved writing this video for you all to enjoy. Thank you all so much for watching this far. However, even if the game is over and King Barrel's pieces are being rolled away on the moon, we aren't done just yet. Not only is there some post-game content to talk about, more importantly, we can finally discuss those DLC levels we ignored earlier in the video. We've been on a pretty long streak of just talking about levels though, so how about we take a short break to go over some things that I need to throw in this video somewhere before we actually finish this bitch once and for all. Well, for one, the legendary bro Fist is unlocked as a usable ability for PewDiePie exclusively. It's just another scream wipe attack, but it's probably the most useful out of that bunch. So no real complaints from me. There's also another attack we unlocked at some point that I just forgot to mention, so screw retroactively adding it earlier in the script, we're just gonna talk about it now. Bro Drone spawns a drone that follows you around and shoots enemies for you. Kind of useful, I guess, but I barely found myself using this one, so I can't say much about it. It sure does exist, though. With that aside, how about we go over what happens when you collect all those pesky patches we've been talking about this whole time. Collecting all the patches in the game actually lets you purchase and unlock the final playable character. Duck. Yes, just the duck. He has all the same abilities as the duck power-up we talked about earlier, minus invincibility, and as funny as this character is, I kind of hate playing as them. Because they have an air stall by pressing the jump button again in the air, it makes the window to hit enemy bounces way more strict and kind of ruins this whole character for me. It's a neat reward, and a funny one at that, but it's kind of underwhelming if you want to continue engaging with one of the game's main mechanics. One last thing to talk about before the DLC levels has to do with the difficulty in the game. As stated countless times before, I played the game for this video on hard difficulty. However, I actually went through and played the entire game again on bro mode, the next step up in difficulty. But this time, Time with all the power-ups and hearts I had already collected. Obviously, it was a tough playthrough, but it was much more enjoyable with all the resources I had in the game. But as you may have noticed from the footage of the difficulty select screen in this video, there is a fourth difficulty in this game. Beating any level on bro mode will unlock the next step up, pug mode. Pug mode is like the game on crack and was the only thing I was unable to fully complete for this video. Instead of playing as the characters you've been playing as the entire game, this mode forces you to play as one of two new characters, Maya and Edgar. 
Pug Mode takes away your abilities, makes the levels the hardest they can be, and gives you one heart in every level. If you get hit a single time, it's all the way back to the start of the level for you. Don't think I didn't try to beat this mode, by the way. I have footage of me playing like half the game on this difficulty, but it's just so time consuming that the video would probably be pushed back like a month if I tried to do it all. The only upside to this difficulty is that since you play as smaller characters, your hitbox is also significantly smaller than normal. This makes you harder to hit, which is obviously useful in a mode where one hit equals death. Listen, pug mode is a neat challenge, and there's nothing wrong with it being included as a fun little side thing to do if you want to. But man, does this game not prepare you for this at all. For the whole game up until this point, you're encouraged to use and buy abilities that help you survive longer in levels that you may have not otherwise. This mode strips all that safety away in one go, and it feels almost like too much. Maybe if the abilities were removed or limited to one in bro mode, this would feel like a more reasonable curve, but as it stands, this is a severe difficulty spike. Thanks to pug mode, I also have no idea what happens in this game when you 100% it. I looked everywhere online, I swear to god, but I cannot find anything. Maybe that's just because there's nothing that happens, which is very likely the case, but if any of you know, please leave a comment about it. One day I will sit down and actually complete pug mode, but today is not that day. Maybe I'll even stream it. Probably not but who knows. All right, I think that was a good enough break. It's time to tackle the final five levels that PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist has to offer. That might seem like a lot, especially for this fucking video. Trust me, I get it, but I'll try to run through these a little faster. No promises though, once again. Here is level 24, Pumpkin Hollow. So, like all the DLC levels in this game, Pumpkin Hollow is based on a specific holiday. In this case, it's Halloween, but the other levels are Christmas and Valentine's themes respectively. The DLC levels don't add a ton of content overall, but there's still enough here that they could have realistically charged like a few bucks for each of these levels, so them being free is a really cool bonus. Pumpkin Hollow is a standard platforming level, just like all the other DLC levels, and it features some really cool platforming challenges. The environment here is next level as well, featuring a whole new tile set for the platform platforms and background. Candles strung along the bottom of the screen act as your main platform, while pumpkin seeds naturally hanging from the roof of the pumpkin act as floating platforms. Kind of a random tangent, but I always love it when 2D platformers try and work the typical floating platforms into the environment of the level so they look less awkward. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze does a lot of that, and I'm glad, even if it's just for one level, this game does it too. Bringing back those candles I mentioned earlier, they're actually used in some really neat ways that make traversing around the pumpkin hollow more interesting. For example, sometimes Sometimes they'll be stacked up in a way where you need to go through a certain section to make progress, and other times, a candle will be lit up and creates a bit of a dead end that you need to work around. I just thought that was a really fun way the devs spruced up the layout of this level in particular. Three out of four of these DLC levels feature bonus patches, which aren't for anything really, but just add a little more flavor to these levels. There's a part in Pumpkin Hollow that I briefly hinted at earlier, where you need to use bats in order to bounce up to a patch, and I always thought that little challenge was so great. I'm glad these extra patches were included. When it comes to new stuff this level offers, it's really just one thing. There is one new enemy type in Pumpkin Hollow, which is this ghost barrel. It's the exact same as a regular barrel, but moves slightly faster and only appears once in the entire level and never again. Why do you exist? <laughs> final thing of relevance to bring up here is that the music for all these DLC levels are fucking great, and I actually have a little bit of a story to tell regarding these DLC tracks in particular. So, the YouTube uploads of the Legend of the Brofist OST were all made before the DLC was added, which means the most popular playlists and such just don't feature them. So, you'd probably think that at least one other person ended up uploading the DLC tracks at some point, but it never happened. I would hear these tracks in-game, go to find them on YouTube, and be met with zero results. So? I just ripped the fucking tracks from the game myself for this video, so both you and I can listen to them right now. I'd upload them myself, but I really have nowhere to actually put them, so I beg someone watching to just do it themselves. I would appreciate that immensely. Anyway, listen to this fire-ass pumpkin music. It's fire, right? How these have never been uploaded is beyond me. Next up, we actually have a pair of levels to talk about, that being the Christmas levels. These are levels 25 and 26, Holiday Vertigo and Log House. Starting with Holiday Vertigo, man are the aesthetics here on point. 
The giant Christmas lights and ornaments hanging from the tall trees, serving as platforms to jump on are so cool and look great as well. Just in general though, this is a really sick concept for a level. It takes elements from both the snow levels and the forest slash cave levels and combines them together as one big mish mashup. The bats and tall trees from the forest are here, while the rarely seen wind and ice spike mechanics also make appearances as well. I think this level hits way harder playing it after beating the game first, because seeing these mechanics all make a return at once just hits all the harder that way. This level also features another new barrel type, one that thankfully shows up for more than a single time in its level. These are the pinecone barrels, and they're pretty much just the rolling barrels with a bigger hurt box. Nothing crazy, but at least they're aesthetically fitting, and once again, show up for more than one appearance total. The music for both these Christmas levels are actually the exact same, which makes it a good in-between topic to bring up before I actually talk about that next level. The music here is actually just a remix of the Christmas classic, Jingle Bells, but it's changed up enough to be in line with the rest of the Legend of the Bro Fist OST. Christmas level, Log House, actually tells a bit of a story when played back to back with the previous level. Since the cabin is right outside the forest from the previous level, the spiky vines from said previous level have started taking over the cabin, leading to a super interesting set of platforming challenges using both the layout of the house and the layouts of the vines around the house. However, while this is super cool, I do have a bit of an issue with the inconsistent properties of said spiky vines. In Holiday Vertigo, these vines are true insta-kill objects. Regardless if you have companions or not, you will die instantly if you touch the these vines. However, in this level, they work more like normal insta-kill objects in this game, letting your companions take the hit for you. It's just a weird thing to have be different between two levels that appear back to back and are so connected to each other. Other than that though, this level is great and I love the long windy stairs you have to constantly walk up to reach the goal. Makes dealing with the barrels a whole different experience. You may have noticed that during this video, I've been playing as a lot of characters wearing costumes. And that's because, as part of the free DLC, they also added costumes for every character to go along with these levels. These don't do anything other than change how you look, but it helps make the playable cast feel more varied even though it isn't. I bring this up now because the Valentine's DLC level did not add any more of these costumes, except for one exception. The Valentine's update added a single costume for PewDiePie that makes him look like an angel, except it's not just a normal costume. For some reason, he gains the exact same abilities as the duck upon wearing this costume. This single-handedly makes the duck the most worthless character to grind for in the entire game because you get the exact same ability on a better character with a better ability pool for free. <laughs> Very odd choice and I still don't understand it to this day. Speaking of that Valentine's Day level, how about we actually go over it? This is level 27, Love is in the Air. The first thing I gotta say about this level is regarding the music. The music in this level is a remix of the music that plays during the Cry X PewDiePie love scene from earlier in the game, which is obviously very funny and also fucked in hindsight for a laundry list of reasons. But enough about the music, what about the actual level? Well, it's pretty good. Like most of these DLC levels, I don't have much to say about it since they reuse a lot of ideas from levels I've already talked about for hours at this point, but there's still some stuff I wanna bring up. For starters, this level is essentially just the secret fourth nostalgia level, just without the iconic music and an added pink coat of paint. Grouping it in with those levels, I'd say this is the hardest of the bunch by a long shot. The whole level takes place on a bottomless pit and your options for platforms are all very small, so there is minimal room for air on any and all jumps. This level also features a really, really long enemy bouncing section that is super fun and tests your skills from the entire game, which feels fitting since this was the last level they added to the game. Lots of iconic wait and survive segments in this level as well, since a good chunk of the progression here relies on using these moving clouds to get further in the level. And of course, while you're on these moving clouds, everything wants you dead, including enemies and spikes. Overall, this is a really solid platforming challenge and makes for a good send off to this fantastic game. With that done, we are now finished talking about every single standard platforming level that PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist has to offer. However, we still aren't done here. There is one final level remaining, the final find and survive level. But before we can get into that, there is one quick detour remaining as well. There is actually one final piece of post-game content I have yet to bring up, Alpha Omega. This could technically be counted as level 29, but the game doesn't do that, so I won't either. That's probably because it isn't really a level and is actually an endless mode. 
Basically, you're thrown into a very small survival map and are forced to survive as long as you can. There is no end goal, just try to survive. Enemies from the entire game will randomly spawn here, which forces you to think quickly and remember how you dealt with them in the past. I haven't played a lot of this mode, personally it's just not really my thing, but it's a cool addition regardless, and I can see some people getting a lot of mileage out of it. Well, here we are. 27 levels later, we have finally made it to the final level in the entire game. It was a long time coming, but here it is. Level 28, Paradise Island. No, you're not having a stroke from watching this video for so long. This final level is actually not a new level at all, and is in fact a ported over version of the Game Jam game that started all of this so long ago. It truly is the perfect ending point for both the game itself and this video, huh? It's not really a great level, in fact it's probably my least favorite find and survive in the entire game, but it's not the level itself that matters. It's what it stands for. PewDiePie Legend of the Brofist started out as something small, and it grew and grew into the fantastic game you've watched me review today. It grew so much that its origin point, the Paradise Island itself, just became a blip in the sea of content to explore here. So even if it's pretty bad compared to the rest of the game, I wouldn't want any other level to end off this game. And end off this video. So many years have passed since the release of this game, and so much has happened. PewDiePie retired from YouTube, got married, moved to Japan, and had a kid. The other YouTubers featured in the game like Markiplier and Jack all continued on with their careers and are bigger than ever before. Then there's Outer Minds, the brilliant studio that took a shot in the dark and struck gold, making such a great game as your first ever real non-mobile video game is almost unheard of outside of a few cases. Which is why it saddens me so much that they were pretty much back to making mobile shit right after this. If you were to ask a random person on the street what they knew Outer Minds from, it would probably be one of their other PewDiePie games, Tuber Simulator. This game is fine, but it's no Legend of the Brofist, and it just makes me sad. I'll be following Outer Minds closely over the next couple years to see if they ever bother making something as great as this game because I know that studio has serious talent, but as it stands, I don't know how soon that will happen. Trust me, I would kill for a spiritual successor or something to Legend of the Brofist. Finally, we have Legend of the Brofist itself. You already know my thoughts on this game. We've been here long enough at this point that I don't need to run you through all that again. Outer Minds will stream or acknowledge the game from time to time, but as it stands, I could never see this game getting released again. Whether it be for the cry stuff or even some of PewDiePie's own controversies, it just doesn't seem likely. So here we have it. One of the most fun, creative, and interesting 2D platformers I have ever played, stuck in limbo forever. And you know what? Maybe I'm fine with that. Legend of the Brofist truly encapsulates the era it was made in. Most of the jokes in it make no sense if you weren't into the Let's Play scene at the time, and it was designed to be that way. A time capsule into a simpler time in YouTube history where a game like this could even realistically be made, released, and see success. It's not like it was delisted or anything. You can thankfully still play the game to this very day, so I guess I'm fine letting it rest in the place where it began. Wrapping up a video as big as this one is hard, you know? You spend so long writing and planning this big epic video, but ending it is always the hard part. Well, I'll say this. Play this game. Even if I just spoiled every little thing about it, the platforming and the gameplay alone is fun enough to warrant playing it. It's on Steam and mobile, so you probably have something that can run it. Go give Outer Minds some love, they fucking deserve it. That's pretty much it then. Thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, stay awesome bros. I'd brofist the camera, but sadly I am a PNG dog. Goodbye everybody!